அலமதுலாஹிரபிலாலமீன் வசலாத்து வசலாம் வலா நபீல் கரீம் வாலி அஸ்ஹபி அஜ்மீன் வசலாம் வலா மணி தபேல் ஹுதா அம்மாபாத் குட் மார்னிங் லேடிஸ் அண்ட் ஜென்டல்மேன் இட் ஈஸ் இன் டீட் எ மேட்டர் ஆஃப் கிரேட் ப்ளேஷர் அண்ட் ப்ராய்ட் ஃபார் ஆல் த சிட்டிசன்ஸ் ஆஃப் பீவண்டி to have among us today dr zakir naik i take this opportunity to welcome dr zakir naik and the dignitaries from all walks of the life on behalf of the organizers aksa educational society there has been another change in the program as it was announced the commissioner of the police mr bohite will be the president of the function but because of some contingencies he has sent his apologies it's very kind of mr hingurani a senior advocate to have accepted to preside today's function i really thank him on behalf of aksa educational society friends we are about to start our formal function i hereby call upon qari abdul salam to come on the desk for recital of quran qari abdul salam assalamu alaikum أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس تَقُولُ رَبَّكُمُ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُم مِّن نَّفْسٍ وَاحِدَةٍ وَخَلَقَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا وَبَثَّ مِنْهُمَا Jazakallah Qari Abdul Salam has just recited the first verse from Surah Nisa from Holy Quran For the benefit of all those who are present here I would like to give the translation thereof Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim In the name of Allah most gracious most merciful يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ اتَّقُوا رَبَّكُمُ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُم مِّن نَّفْسٍ وَاحِدَةٍ O mankind fear your guardian lord who created you from a single person wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa bassa minhuma rijalan kaseeran wa nisaa created out of it his mate and from them twine scattered like seeds countless men and women وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءُلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ Fear Allah, through whom you demand your mutual rights 
and be heedful of worms that bore you. Inna Allah kana alaykum raqiba, for Allah ever watches over you. That is the translation of the first verse of Surah Nisa. Now I call upon the chairman of Aqsa Educational Society, Mr. Javid Farid, to give a brief introduction of Aqsa Educational Society. Mr. Javid Farid. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Salatam wa salamun ala Rasulah al-Kareem. Respected President of this function, Educate Hingurani Sahib, our Chief Guest of this function, Educate Parbakar Hegar Sahib, Main Speaker of this function, Dr. Zakir Nahik Sahib, Main Organizer of this function, on behalf of Aksa Education Society, Mr. Abdul Majid Narwil Sahib, our Guest of Honours, Brothers and Sisters, Assalamu Alaikum. On behalf of Aksa Education Society, I welcome you all on this particular occasion and function. Aqsa Educational Society was established in the year 1980 under the guidance and supervision and thoughts given by, at that time, our religious and spiritual guide Maulana Abdus Samash Sharfuddin Sahib. His idea was at that time that and it, the women of our society must get perfect and good education so that as soon as they'll get good education, they'll prove themselves as good housewives, good mothers, and then immediately they'll be an asset to the society and of course they'll just take care very gracefully uh, total problems of their families and all that and for that purpose and idea in 1987 we started Aksa Girls High School with just 127 students at that time Alhamdulillah by grace of Allah Within 10 years, that is in 1998 this year, the strength of girl students has gone up to 2,700. And inshallah, in the year 1999, June, it is expected to go up to 3,000. Of course, I know that you have come to listen, not much to me, but to Dr. Naik. So, please, Excuse me and listen to him. Thank you. Thank you, Jayit Bhai. And as the protocol demands, I would like to introduce to you in a very brief manner the distinguished guests who are occupying the stage. As told to you earlier, Mr. K. R. Hingurani, he has kindly consented to preside over the function in absence of Mr. Mohite. Mr. K. R. Hingurani, advocate for last 45 years in Bhivandi. He was president of Bhivandi Bar Association for last six years. And he has in-depth studied comparative religion. Our chief guest of the day, Prabhakar Hegres, personality is well known to Bhivandi people. He is a leading lawyer of state for last 50 years. He was also member of the Law Commission and he is pioneer of the legal aid and Lok Adalat which was first held in Bhivandi. At the age of 75 years he is still an active advocate 
and ideal for aspiring young advocates. He has written books for the guidance of the junior practicing lawyers on subjects like bail and injunctions. As veteran congressman, he was district congress president and also vice president of MPCC. Presently, he is busy defending Tada victims in Bombay. Our main speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik, President of Islamic Research Foundation, is a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. He is the main driving spirit by Alhamdulillah behind the Islamic Research Foundation getting worldwide acclaim for the proper presentation, understanding and clarification of Islam, as well as removing misconception about Islam. Though a medical doctor by professional training, he has turned around to spread the real truth of Islam worldwide especially amongst millions of English-speaking audience. At only 32 years, Dr. Zakir explains the teachings of Islam and clears misconceptions convincingly with the help of reason, logic, and science. He has tremendous ability to quote extensively and verbatim from Holy Quran and other religious scriptures. Dr. Zakir is renowned for his critical analysis and his spontaneous and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by the audiences and skeptics about his public talks in open question and answer sessions. He has delivered more than 200 public talks in the last two years itself in United States of America, Canada, United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, UAE, Kuwait, Qatar, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and Singapore. In addition to many public talks in India, he has also participated in symposium with prominent personalities of all the other faiths. Dr. Zakir has appeared on various international TV programs and satellite and TV channels programs in the United States of America, Malaysia, India, etc. He is regularly quizzed and interviewed by the media worldwide, especially on why Islam conflicts with issues of women's rights, human rights, modern science, and secularism. But his dynamic resolve to dispel media myths about Islam with facts, specific references, and proper context stand out to rectify or neutralize the prejudice or media bias, if any, based on unwarranted presumption or conclusion. More than a hundred of Dr. Zaki's lectures, debates, and symposia available on video and audio cassettes are popular. He has authored books on Islam and comparative religion. Friends, there I end the introductory part. I welcome on behalf of the Aksa Educational Society, DCP, Mr. Saxena, who has just arrived on the stage. And I request now Brother Muhammad to take care of the rest of the session. Brother Muhammad. Jazakallah khair for your kind introduction. Our session would be as such. We would have a talk on Universal Brotherhood by Dr. Zakir Naik, which would be followed by the question and answer session in which our audience, the press, people present here, including our learned chief guest, the president, and our DCP of the area, they are welcome to question or cross-examine or put forward any queries they may have on the topic of Universal Brotherhood, so all present here have a better understanding of the topic. We'll begin right away with the talk on Universal Brotherhood by Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, wa ala rasulillah, wa ala ali wa sahabi ajma'in, amma baad, auz billahi min ash-shaytani rajim بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة خلق منها زوجها بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس إن خلقناكم من زق وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعرفوا إن أكرمكم من الله يتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شوه لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني Yafkahu Kauli, respected Advocate Hegde, Advocate Hingorani, my respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters. I welcome all of you 
with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. The topic of this morning's talk is Universal Brotherhood. There are various types of brotherhoods. For example, brotherhood based on blood relationships, brotherhood based on regions, on race, on caste, on creeds, etc. But all these types of brotherhood, they are limited. Islam, alhamdulillah, believes in universal brotherhood. It doesn't believe that human beings have been created in castes or in different levels. And I start my talk by quoting a verse from the glorious Quran, from Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, which describes the Islamic concept of universal brotherhood in the best way. It says, Ya ayyuha nasu, inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa, wa ja'alnaakum shu'ubaw qaba'ila lita'arafu, inna akramakum in the Allah yadkakum, inna Allah alimun kabir, which means that, O oh humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other not that you shall despise each other and the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa and Allah is all-knowing full of knowledge and well acquainted with all things this verse of the glorious Quran says that O oh, humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female. That means the whole human race originates from a single pair of male and female. All the human beings in the world, they have a common grandparent. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we have divided the human race into nations and tribes so that they shall recognize each other. Not that they shall despise and fight amongst themselves. And the criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this verse says, doesn't depend on sex, caste, color, creed, or wealth, but it depends on taqwa, that is God consciousness, that's piety, that's righteousness. Anyone who's more righteous, who's more pious, who's more God conscious, is honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah has full knowledge and is well acquainted with all things. Further, the glorious Quran says in Surah Room, chapter number 30, verse number 22, that, and amongst his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth. And the variation in your languages and your colors. Verily, in that is a sign for those who know. The glorious Quran says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created various types of languages and different colors, black, human being, white, brown, yellow. And these are signs. These variations in colors and language is not to despise each other because Every language that you have on the face of the earth, it's a beautiful language. It may sound funny if it is unique to you. You may not have heard that language before. It may sound funny. But those people who speak that language, for them, it's the most beautiful language. So Allah says, he has created various languages and colors so that you may recognize, you may know each other. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 70, وَلَقَدْ قَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, has honored the children of Adam. Allah doesn't say that he has honored only the Arabs, 
or the Americans or a particular race, but Almighty God has honored all the children of Adam, irrespective of race, caste, color, creed or sex. And there are many faiths, there are many religions who believe that the humankind has originated from a single pair. That is Adam and Eve, peace be upon them. But there are some faiths which say that it is because of the sin of the woman, that is Eve, may Allah be pleased with her, that the human beings are born in sin. And they put the blame only on the woman, that is Eve, for the downfall of the human beings. In fact, the Quran speaks about the story of Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, in several places. But in all the places, the blame is equally put on both of them, Adam and Eve, peace be upon them. And if you read Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 19 to 27, Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, they are addressed more than a dozen of times. And the Quran says that both of them disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. Both of them repented and both were forgiven. Both are equally blamed for the mistake. There is not a single verse in the glorious Quran which puts the blame only on Eve. May Allah be pleased with her. But there is a verse in the glorious Quran in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 121, which says that Adam, peace be upon him, disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you read the Quran, both are equally blamed for not obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They both repented and they both were forgiven. And certain faiths, they say that because Eve disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is responsible for the sin of humankind, which Islam doesn't agree, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cursed the woman and said that she will bear labor pains. That means pregnancy is a curse according to some people, which Islam doesn't agree at all. And the Qari recited the verse from the glorious Quran from Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number one, which says, respect the womb that bore you. In Islam, pregnancy does not degrade a woman, it uplifts a woman. And the Quran says in Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse number 14, that, O oh, humankind, we have enjoined on you to be good to your parents. In travail upon travail did your mother bore him, and in years to wane was his weaning. The Quran says in Surah Ahqaf, chapter 46, verse number 15, we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In pain did his mother bore him, and in pain did she give him birth. Pregnancy uplifts a woman, it does not degrade her. And in Islam, men and women are equal. And according to a hadith, which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, worm number eight, in the book of Adab, chapter number two, hadith number two, a person came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad peace be upon him, and asked him that who is the person who deserves the maximum love and companionship in this world? And the Prophet said, your mother. The man asked, who next? The Prophet said, your mother. The man asked, after that who? The Prophet repeated for the third time, your mother. The man asked, after that who? Then the Prophet said, your father. In short, 75%, three-fourth of the love and companionship of the children are due to the mother. 25%, one-fourth of the love and companionship goes to the father. In short, the mother gets the gold medal. She gets the silver medal, as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. These are the teachings of Islam. In Islam, men and women are equal. But equality does not mean identicality. There are many misconceptions, especially when women are concerned in Islam. Many Muslims and non-Muslims, they have a misconception. Which can be removed if you understand the authentic sources, Quran and the Sahih Hadith correctly. As I mentioned, men and women are overall equal. 
But equality does not mean identicality. Let me give you an example. That if in a class of students, two students, student A and B, they come out first, and both acquire 80 marks out of 100. But if you analyze the answer sheet, there are 10 questions, each carrying 10 marks. In the first answer, student A gets 9 out of 10. Student B gets 7 out of 10. So in question 1, student A has a degree of advantage than student B. In question 2, student B gets 9 out of 10. And student A gets 7 out of 10. In question 2, student B has a degree of advantage than student A. In the remaining 8 questions, both get 8 out of 10. And if you total the marks of both the students, both get 80 out of 100. So if you analyze, both student A and B are overall equal. But in the answers to some questions, student A has a degree of advantage. In answers to some questions, student B has a degree of advantage. But overall, both are equal. Similarly in Islam, men and women are equal. Brotherhood in Islam does not only mean that the same sexes are equal. The universal brother in Islam means that besides race, caste, and creed, even the sex are overall equal. Men and women are equal in Islam. But in some aspects, the men have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the women have a degree of advantage. But overall, both are equal. For example, if a robber enters my house, I will not say that I believe in women's rights, I believe in women's liberation, therefore my sister, my wife, my mother should go and fight the robber. Because Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 34 that Allah has given men more strength than the other. That men have more strength than the women. So where strength is concerned, the men have a degree of advantage. So since they have been given more strength, it's their duty to protect the women. Here, the men have a degree of advantage. Where love and companionship is concerned, where children should give to the parents, the women have a degree of advantage. As I mentioned earlier, the mother gets three times more respect and companionship than the father. Here, the women have a degree of advantage. But overall, if you analyze, men and women are equal in Islam. And for more details, you can refer to my video cassette. I had given a talk on women's rights in Islam, modernizing outdated. It's part one. That's the lecture. And part two, this is the question under session. These discuss the issue in great detail, and many misconceptions which are there in the minds of the human being have been removed here. And in this talk, I've divided the women's rights in Islam under six broad headings, spiritual rights, economic rights, social rights, legal rights, educational rights, and the political rights. And I've described there that overall men and women are equal. The concept of Almighty God in Islam, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is not that Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the deity of a particular race or a particular group of people. But the Quran says in Surah Fatiha, chapter number one, verse number two, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, praise be to the Lord of the worlds. Almighty God is referred as Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of the worlds. And in the last surah of the glorious Quran, that is Surah Nas, chapter 114, verse number one, it says, Qul auz bi Rabbil Nas, that say I seek refuge with the Lord of humankind. Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the Lord of the whole of humankind, not of a particular group of people or a particular race. And there are various verses in the glorious Quran which begin by saying, Ya ayyuhan nas, O humankind. Ya ayyuhan nas, O humankind. Ya ayyuhan nas, O humankind. And even the two verses I quote in the beginning of my talk, they began with, Ya ayyuhan nas, O humankind. And 
the glorious Quran also says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 168. Ya ayyuhan nas, O humankind, eat of what is on the earth, good and lawful for you, and follow not the footstep of the devil, for he is to you an avowed enemy. Islam, in order for universal will in the world, it has a moral code. It has a moral law, which helps in universal brotherhood prevailing throughout the world, throughout the universe. The Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, that if anyone kills a person, unless it be for murder or for spreading mischief in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole nation, all the people. And if any person saves a life, it is as though he has saved the whole of humankind, all the people. The Quran says that if any person kills any human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, it doesn't specify the race or caste or color or creed. If any person kills any human being, unless it be for murder, or for spreading mischief in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves any human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, from any caste, color, or creed, it is as though he has saved the whole of humankind. The Quran has various laws of moral conduct so that universal brotherhood will prevail throughout the universe. The glorious Quran says that no one should ever rob. It's a crime. It's a sin. Islam has a system of zakat that is any rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in charity. If every human being in the world gives zakat, Poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. And the glorious Quran says that you should love and help your neighbors. The Quran says in Surah Ma'un, chapter number 107, verse number 127. Araita <laughs> that fears thou not the person who denies the day of judgment and deals the orphan with harshness and encourages not the feeding of the indigent. Woe to those who are neglectful of the prayers. Woe to those who pray only to be seen of men, who do not even provide neighborly assistance. The Quran says that woe to those people who do not even provide neighborly assistance. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that he is not a Muslim who sleeps with his full stomach while his neighbors are hungry. That means any person who sleeps with his full stomach, that means had a good meal, while his neighbors are hungry is not following the commandments of Allah and His Rasul. The glorious Quran says that do not be a spendthrift. The Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 26 and 27, that do not squander your wealth like that of a spendthrift, for verily, spendthrifts are the brothers of the evil one, of the Satan. If you are a spendthrift, you are bound to disturb the universal brotherhood. Because, but natural, if a person squanders, it creates animosity, it creates enmity, it creates envy between the brothers. A person should not rob, a person should give charity, a person should provide neighborly assistance. All these are moral conducts mentioned in the glorious Quran. The Quran further says that you should not bribe. The Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 188, that spend not your wealth on vanities and do not use it as a bait for judges in order you may eat somebody else's property. That means do not use your wealth to bribe the people. 
so that you may eat up other people's wealth. Islam doesn't agree in eating up your brother's wealth. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you believe, innam al khamru al maisuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal ansabu al aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rishtum min amali shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. Fashtanibu lalakum tuflihun, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. The glorious Quran says that abstain from having intoxicants, alcohol, drugs, from gambling, from dedication of stones, divination of arrows, all these are Satan's handiwork. And we know that intoxicants is one of the root cause for various evils in the society. It prevents the universal brotherhood from prevailing. And according to statistics, it tells us that in America, on average, every day, more than 1,900 cases of rape take place. And in most of the cases, either the victim or the rapist is intoxicated. The studies of America tell us that there is 8% of incest in America. That means every 12th or 13th person you come across in America, he has committed incest. That is, having sexual relationship with close relatives, father and daughter, son and mother, brother and sister. And majority, almost all the cases, it's under the state of intoxication. AIDS is spreading in the world. One of the reasons is intoxicants. Therefore, the Quran says, intoxicants and gambling, it's a Satan's handiwork. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. If you abstain from these evil things, universal brotherhood will be helped in prevailing throughout the universe. The glorious Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 32, nor come close to adultery, for it is a shameful deed. It's an evil opening other roads to evil. Islam is against adultery. The glorious Quran says in Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, verse number 11 and 12, that, Ya ayyuhal lazina amun, O you believe, let not some men among you laugh at the others. You may never know that the latter may be better than the former. Let not some women among you laugh at the other. You may never know that the latter may be better than the former. Do not defame one another, nor be sarcastic, or call each other with nicknames. Avoid suspicion, for in many cases, suspicion is a sin. Do not spy on one another. Do not backbite. Do not speak ill of one another behind the backs. Are you ready to eat the dead meat of your brother? The Quran says that if you backbite, if you slander anyone behind the back, it is as though you are eating the meat of your dead brother. And eating the meat of your dead brother is a double sin. Eating dead meat itself is prohibited. Eating meat of your dead brother is double crime. Even the cannibals who eat human beings, they do not eat the flesh of their brother. So if you backbite, if you speak ill about somebody else behind the back, it is a double crime. It is eating the meat of your dead brother. And the Quran gives the answer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, nay, you would abhor it. No one would ever like it. The Quran says in Surah Humza, chapter 104, verse number one, Woe to every kind of scandal monger and backbiter. All these laws of moral conduct given the glorious Quran and Sayyid Hadith, they promote universal brotherhood. Besides talking about universal brotherhood, the uniqueness about Islam is that it practically demonstrates the universal brotherhood. The Muslims are supposed to demonstrate the universal brotherhood, five times a day in the Salah. When we offer Salah, we practically demonstrate the universal brotherhood. It's mentioned 
in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Adan, chapter number 75, hadith number 692, that Hazrat Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, that when we stood for Salah, the shoulder of the companions touched with the shoulder of the companion. Our feet touched with the feet of a companion. The beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned Sunnah Abu Dawood, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 245. Hadith number 666, our beloved Prophet said, before starting the Salah, that straighten your rows, stand shoulder to shoulder, and do not leave any gap or opening for the devil. The Prophet said, stand close to each other during Salah, and do not leave any opening for the devil. The Prophet was not referring to the devil, which you see in the Onida TV ad. You know the Onida TV ad? The devil with the two horns and a tail? The Prophet was not referring to that devil. He was referring to the devil of racism, of caste, of color, of wealth, irrespective whether you're rich or poor, whether you're king or pauper. When you stand for prayers, when you stand for salah, stand shoulder to shoulder. So that the brotherhood increases. The devil of racism, of caste, of color, of creed, of wealth does not come in between you. And the best example of international brotherhood is in the pilgrimage of Islam, that is during Hajj. About two and a half million people from various parts of the world, they come to Makkah to perform Hajj. People from various parts of the world, from America, from Canada, from UK, from Singapore, from Malaysia, from India, from Pakistan, from Indonesia, from various parts of the world they come, and the men, they're dressed up in two pieces of unsewn cloth, that preferably white. You cannot identify that the person standing next to you, whether he's a king or a pauper. It's the best example of international brotherhood. It is the biggest annual gathering of the world. Two and a half million people gather every year. And the person standing next to you, you cannot make out whether he's a king or a pauper. Irrespective whether you're rich or poor, black or white, from whichever part of the world you're coming, you're dressed in the same attire. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, in the speech of his favorite pilgrimage, he said that there is only one God, and no Arab is superior to a non-Arab, nor is a non-Arab superior to an Arab. A white is not superior to a black, nor a black over the white. The only criteria for superiority is taqwa, its righteousness, its piety, its God consciousness irrespective whichever race you belong to, whichever color you have, that doesn't make you superior. In the sight of Allah, all are equal. Only if you're more pious, more God conscious, more righteous, can you be superior to the other human being. And when the Hajj is performed, every person, he recites, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik. Labbaik la sharika laka Labbaik. Inna alhamda, wal ni'amata, laka wal mulk, la sharika lak. They keep on repeating, labbaik, allahumma labbaik, labbaik, la sharika lak, labbaik. Even when he comes back from hajj, that always remains in his mind, labbaik, allahumma labbaik, which means, here I am, oh my lord, here I am. Labbaik, la sharika lak, labbaik, here I am, you have no partners, here I am. Inna alhamda, wal ni'amata. All praises are due to you. All bounties are yours. Lakaw al mulk, la sharika lak. To you belong the whole dominion, the whole universe, and you have no partners. It is ingrained in his mind that labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Here I am, O oh my Lord, here I am. And the cornerstone of the Islamic faith is the belief in one and only soul, creator, and sustainer of the entire universe. He alone deserves worship. And it is because of belief in one God that there can be universal brotherhood. That means the same God has created 
all the human beings, irrespective whether you're rich or poor, whether a male or female, whether black or white, whichever caste, color, creed you belong to, all of them are equal because you are created by one and only sole creator, Almighty God. Only if you believe in one God can you practice universal brotherhood. That's the reason that all the major religions which believe in the concept of God, on a higher level, they believe in the existence of one almighty God. And according to Oxford Dictionary, religion means a belief in a superhuman controlling power, a God or gods that deserve worship and obedience. So in short, if you want to analyze any religion, you have to understand the concept of God in that religion. And the best way to analyze the concept of God in any religion is not by looking at what the followers are doing, because many of the followers themselves do not know what the religious scriptures speak about Almighty God. The best way is to analyze what the scripture of that religion has to speak about Almighty God. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, Kul, Ya Hilal Kitab. Say, O people of the book, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa in banana bainakum, that come to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam, that we associate no partners with Him. Wala yatakhida baaduna baadban arbaban minun illa, that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fa'intawallahu, if then they turn back. Fa'kulu shadu. Say ye bear witness, Bianna Muslimun, that we are Muslims, bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah shows you a way how to speak with different people. It says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa'im, bainana bainakum, that come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam, that we associate no partners with him. So in order to understand the concept of God, in any religion, you have to understand what that scripture has to speak about Almighty God. If you understand the concept of God, you will understand the religion. Let's first analyze the concept of God in Hinduism. If you ask a common Hindu, who is a layman, that how many gods are there? Some may say three, some may say hundred, some may say thousand, while others may say thirty-three crores. 330 million. But if you ask a learned person who's well versed with the Hindu scriptures, he will tell you that the Hindus should actually worship only one God. And they should believe only in one God. But the common Hindu, he believes in a philosophy known as pantheism. What the common Hindu says, that everything is God. The tree is God, the sun is God, the moon is God, the monkey is God, the human being is God, the snake is God. What we Muslims say, that everything is God's, G-O-D with apostrophe, yes. Everything belongs to God. The tree belongs to God, the sun belongs to God, the moon belongs to God, the monkey belongs to God, the human being belongs to God, the snake belongs to God. So the major difference between the Hindus and the Muslims is that the common Hindu says everything is God, we Muslims say everything is God's. G-O-D with apostrophe S. The only difference is apostrophe S. If we can solve this difference of apostrophe S, the Hindus and the Muslims will be united. How do we do it? Quran says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa'im bainana bainakum. That come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. The most common scripture, which is the most widely read by the Hindus, is the Bhagavad Gita. If you read Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 20, it says that all those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods. That means those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship gods besides the one true God. And if you read the Upanishads, which is another sacred scripture of the Hindus, it's mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number 6, 
section number two, verse number one. Ekam evidityam. There is only one God without a second. It's mentioned in the Sveta Setara Upanishad, chapter number six, verse number nine. Na kasya kasij janita na kadipa. Which means, of him, of Almighty God, there are no lords, neither do they have any parents. It's mentioned in the Sveta Setara Upanishad, chapter number four, verse number 19. Na pratima asti. Of him, there is no likeness. It's mentioned in the Sveta Setara Upanishad, chapter number four, verse number 20, that he has got no form. No one can see him with the eyes. Among the scriptures of the Hindus, the most sacred are the Vedas. There are basically four Vedas. The Rig Ved, the Ajur Ved, the Sam Ved, and the Atharva Ved. If you read the Ajur Ved, it's mentioned in chapter number 32, verse number 3, Nata Sipratima Asti. Of him, there is no image. Almighty God has got no images. It's mentioned in the Ajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 8, that Almighty God is bodiless and pure. And the next verse of Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 9 says, that andhatma pavishanti ya asambuddhi mupaste, that they are entering darkness, those who worship the asambuti. Asambuti means the natural things, like air, water, fire. And the verse continues, they are entering more in darkness, those who worship the sambuti. Sambuti are the created things, like chair, table, idols, etc. Who says that? Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 9. Further, if you read, it's mentioned in the Atharva Ved, chapter number 20, hymn number 58, verse number 3, Dev Maha Osi, verily great is Almighty God. Amongst the Vedas, the most sacred is the Rig Ved. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 1, Hymn number 164, verse number 46, that sages and saintly people call Almighty God by various names. And if you read Rig Ved, book number 2, hymn number 1, there are various attributes given to Almighty God. One amongst them, it's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 2, hymn number 1, verse number 3, Brahma. If you translate Brahma into English, one of its meaning is the creator. If you translate into Arabic, it means khalik. We Muslims have got no objection if someone calls Almighty God as khalik or creator or Brahma. But if someone says that Brahma is Almighty God, who has got four heads and on each head is a crown, we Muslims take strong objection to it. Moreover, you are going against Sveta Sitara Upanishad, chapter number six, Verse number nine, which says, Na tasipatima asti. Of him, there is no likeness. You are giving an image to Almighty God. Another beautiful attribute given in the Ved, book number two, hymn number one, verse number three, is Vishnu. If you translate Vishnu into English, one of its meaning is the sustainer, the cherisher. If you translate into Arabic, it means rob. We Muslims have got no objection if someone calls Almighty God as Rab, or Sustainer, or Cherisher, or Vishnu. But if someone says that Vishnu is Almighty God, who has got four hands, and one of his hands is the chakra, the discus, and one of his hands is the lotus, we Muslims take strong objection to it. Moreover, you're giving an image to Almighty God. You're going against Yajur Vaj, chapter number 32, verse number 3, which says, Na tasipatima asti. Of him, there is no image. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, volume number 8, chapter number 1, verse number 1. Ma Chidanyadi Sansad. All praises are due to him alone. Worship him alone. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, volume number 6, hymn number 45, verse number 16. Ya ek it mushtihi. There is only one God. Worship him alone. And the Brahma Sutra, the fundamental creed of Hinduism is, Ekkam Braham Dustya Naste. Niya Naste Kinchan. Bhagwan Eki hai, Dusra Nahi hai. Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Zara bhi Nahi hai. There is only one God, not a second one. Not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. 
So if you read the Hindu scriptures, you should understand the concept of God in Hinduism. Let's analyze the concept of God in Judaism. It's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. Chapter number 6, verse number 4. Moses, peace be upon me, says that Shama Israelo Adnai Lahaino Adnai Khad. It's a Hebrew quotation which means Hear O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 43, verse number 11. I, even I am Lord, and besides me, there is no Savior. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 45, verse number 5. I am Lord, and there is none else. There is no God besides me. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 46, verse number 9. I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. It's mentioned in the book of Exodus. Chapter number 20, verse number 3 and 5, as well as the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 9, it says that thou shalt have none other God besides me. Almighty God is speaking here. That thou shalt have none other God besides me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of any likeness, of anything in the heavens above, in the earth beneath, and in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not served him, nor bow down to them, for I, thy God, is a jealous God. So if you read the Old Testament, you shall understand the concept of God in Judaism. Before I discuss the concept of God in Christianity, I would like to make a few points clear. That Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus' peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus' peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. The Muslims and the Christians, we are going together. But there are some Christians who say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus, peace be upon him, himself says that he is God or where he says, worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, Jesus, peace be upon him, himself says, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devil with the spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I cast out devil with the finger of God. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says that I seek not my will, but God's will, it means he's submitting his will to Almighty God. And if you translate into Arabic, it means Islam. And anyone who submits his will to Almighty God, he's called as a Muslim. Jesus, peace be upon him, he never came to destroy the law of the prophets. In fact, he came to confirm them. And Jesus, peace be upon him, says, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 20, he says that, think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. All these quotations are from the Bible, from the King James Version. Jesus, peace be upon him, says, that think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily, till the heaven and the earth pass, not one jot or tittle shall pass away from the law until all be fulfilled. And whosoever shall break one of the least commandments and teach men to do so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall keep them 
and teach the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, peace be upon him, says that if you want to go to paradise, you have to follow each and every law of the Old Testament, including that God is one, he has got no partners, you cannot create any images of God. And Jesus, peace be upon him, he never claimed that he was almighty God. In fact, he says that he was sent by God. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 24. Jesus, peace be upon him, says that the words that you hear are not mine, but my father's who has sent me. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 3. This is life eternal, so that you may know there is only one God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. It's mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22, that Euro Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, amongst you by wonders and miracles which God did by him and you are witness to it. It says Jesus of Nazareth peace be upon him a man approved of God by wonders and miracles which God did by him and you are witness to it. And when Jesus peace be upon him was asked that which is the first of the commandment he repeated what was earlier said by Moses, peace be upon him. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29. Shama Israelo, Adnai Haino Adnai Khad. Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. So if you read the Bible, you shall understand the concept of God in Christianity. Let's analyze the concept of God in Islam. The best reply that any person can give you regarding the concept of God in Islam is quote to you Surah Class, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Qul huallahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allah samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid walam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Walam yakul kuffan ahad. There is nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Almighty God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any person saying that is Almighty God, if that person four-line definition, the Muslims have got no objection in accepting that person as Almighty God. The first is, Qul hu Allahu ahad, say he is Allah one and only. Second is, Allah hu samad, Allah the absolute and eternal. Third is, Lam yilid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. And the fourth is, Walam kuffan ahad. And there is nothing like him. This Surah class, chapter number 112, is the touchstone of theology. Theo means God, logic means study. Surah class, chapter number 112 of the glorious Quran, is the touchstone of theology. Anyone claiming to be Almighty God, if that candidate fits in this four-line definition, we accept him to be Almighty God. And for the universal brother to prevail, it's compulsory that you believe and worship only one Almighty God. So anyone claiming to be Almighty God, if that person fits in this four-line definition, we have no objection in accepting that candidate as Almighty God. You know there are many false people who claim to be Almighty God. Let's analyze whether they pass the test or not. And one among such person is Bhagwan Rajnish. You know, there are some people who claim that he was Almighty God. During one of my lectures in the question answer time, there was a Hindu friend of ours who told that the Hindus don't believe in Bhagwan Rajnish as God. I told him, I do agree, and I've read the Hindu scriptures. Nowhere does the Hindu scripture say that Bhagwan Rajnish is God. What I said, some people say that Bhagwan Rajnish is God. I know very well that Hinduism doesn't consider Bhagwan Rajnish to be God. Let's analyze the claim of such people who say that Bhagwan Rajnish is Almighty God. The first test is, Qul hu Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Is Bhagwan Rajnish one and only? 
we know that there are several human beings who claim to be Almighty God, especially in this country. There are several such people claiming to be God. Is he one and only? But his followers may say, no, he is one and only. Let's go to the next test. Allah Samad. Allah the Absolute and Eternal. Was Bhagwan Rajneesh Absolute and Eternal? We know from his biography that you are suffering from asthma, from chronic backache, from diabetes mellitus. And he says that the American government, when they arrested him, they gave him slow poisoning. Imagine Almighty God being slow poisoned. The third test is Lam Yalid Walam Yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. And we know from his biography that Rajnish was born in Madhya Pradesh. He had parents, mother and father, who later on became his own disciples. And in the year 1981, Rajnish goes to America and takes thousands of Americans for a ride. And in the state of Oregon, he starts his own village known as Rajnishpuram. Later on, the American government, they arrest him and they put him behind bars. And in 1985, he is deported. He is sent out of the country. He comes back to India in 1985, and the city of Pune, he starts his own center, Dosho Commune. And if you go there, it's mentioned on the stone there, that Bhagwan Rajnish, Osho Rajnish, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. They forgot to mention that he was not given visas to 21 different countries in the world. Imagine Almighty God, he is visiting the earth and he requires visas. And the last test, there's nothing like him. It's so stringent that no one besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God can pass. The moment you can compare Almighty God to anyone in the world, to anything in the world, he is not God. For example, if suppose someone says that Almighty God is a thousand times as strong as Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know Arnold Schwarzenegger? The person who was given the title Mr. Universe, the strongest man in the universe. If someone says that Almighty God is a thousand times as strong as Arnold Schwarzenegger, the moment you can compare Almighty God to anything in this world, whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger or King Kong or Dara Singh, whether it be a thousand times or a million times, the moment you can compare Almighty God to anything in this world, He is not Almighty God. There is nothing like Him. This is a four-line definition of Almighty God given in the glorious Quran, which is the touchstone of theology. Otherwise, the glorious Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, Verse number 110. Kuludullah Avidur Rahman. I am Atadu. Follow Asmal Husna. Say call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. You can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. And there are no less than 99 attributes given in the glorious Quran for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, most merciful, most beneficent, no less than 99. We Muslims, we call Almighty God by the Arabic name Allah. And the reason we prefer calling Almighty God by the Arabic name Allah instead of the English word God is because the English word God, you can play mischief with that word. For example, if you add S to God, it becomes God's plural of God. There is no plural of Allah. Qul huwa Allah ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. If you add D E S S to God, it becomes goddess. That means a female God. There is no gender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is neither male, neither female. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got no gender. Allah is a unique word. If you add a father to God, it becomes Godfather. He's my Godfather. He's my guardian. There's nothing like Allah Father or Allah by in Islam. If you add a mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There's nothing like Allah Mother or Allah mean Islam. Allah is a unique word. If you prefix tin before God, it becomes tin God, meaning fake God. 
There is nothing like Tin Allah in Islam. That is the reason we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. But if some people, some Muslims, use the word God for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that those who don't know the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they can understand, I've got no objection. But the appropriate word is Allah. It's much more preferred than the English word God. In Islam, the universal brotherhood does not only spread horizontally. That is, it doesn't only cover all the regions and all the people of the whole world and universe. It even goes vertically. The universal brotherhood in Islam, the universal brotherhood of faith, includes vertically even the generations that came before you, that went in the past. The universal brotherhood in Islam includes the people living and the people of past. You are a single race. You are a single people. This universal brotherhood, that is the brotherhood of faith, it spreads horizontally as well as vertically. And the cornerstone of this faith, in all the religions, if you analyze, it is the belief in one creator, one almighty God. It is only because of this that universal brotherhood can prevail in the whole universe. And this universal brotherhood of faith, it is far superior to the brotherhood of blood relationships. The Quran says, as I mentioned, you should respect your parents. The Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 23 and 24, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained for you that you worship none but him and that you be kind to your parents. And if any one of them or both of them reach old age, do not say a word of contempt. Don't even say off to them. But lower to them your wing of humility and address them with honor and pray to thy Lord that cherish them as they cherished me in childhood. That means you have to love and respect your parents and give them all honor and respect. But at the same time, the glorious Quran says in Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse number 15, after saying that you have to respect the parents, the Quran says, but if they strive in making thee join partners with me who you have no knowledge of, that means if your parents force you to join partners with Almighty God, you do not obey them. But in this world, deal with them with justice and compassion. That means your parents, you have to obey them as long as they don't go against Almighty God, against the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to obey them. If they go against the commandments, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, is more superior. The brotherhood of faith is universal. It is far superior than brotherhood of blood relationships. And the Quran says in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 24, Kul in kana abaukum, say whether it be for your fathers, wa abnaukum, or your sons, wa ikhwanukum, or your brothers, wa azwajukum, or your spouses, your husbands and wives, wa ashiratukum, or your relatives. Allah is asking, what are your considerations? Is it your fathers? Are they your sons? Your brothers, your spouses, husbands and wives, are their relatives? If all these things, for example, your father, or your sons, or your brothers, or your spouses, or your relatives, and Allah continues, The wealth that you have amassed, the business in which you deal, the house in which you live, Allah is saying, what a consideration. What are your considerations? And Allah continues, that ahabba ilaykum min Allahi wa rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabilihi. If you love all these eight things more than Allah, His Rasul, and doing jihad, striving in the way of Allah, Allah says, if your parents tell you to go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they may tell you to rob, they may tell you to cheat, they may tell you to bribe, they may tell you to kill people unnecessarily. If your parents give you guidance against the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it be your sons, whether it be your brothers, or your spouses, or your relatives, or you do deeds against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the wealth that you are collecting, the business in which you deal, the house in which you delight. Allah says, if you love all these eight things 
more than Allah, his messenger, and striving in the way of Allah. Allah says, Fatarabbasu, wait. Hatta yati Allah biamri. Wallahu la hidul kamul fasiki. Wait until Allah brings about his decision unto you. Until Allah brings about destruction unto you. Wallahu la hidul kamul fasiki. And Allah guides not the poverty transgressors. Where it comes to brotherhood of faith, it is far superior to brotherhood of relationships. And further, the glorious Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 135, that, Ya ayyuhal amanu, O you who believe, stand out firmly for justice as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against your relatives, whether it be rich or poor, for Allah protects both. That means if you have to stand for justice, as giving shahada, as giving witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, stand for justice even if you have to speak against yourself, against your parents, against your relatives, irrespective whether the people are rich or poor, for Allah protects all. That means, where it comes to justice, where it comes to truth, justice is far superior to blood relationships. The brotherhood of faith supersedes all the other brotherhood. And the brotherhood of faith, the universal brotherhood, is based on the basic concept of belief in one creator, one almighty God, one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is preached by all the religions. And the Quran says, as I mentioned earlier, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 64, that, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa'im bainanaminakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Only believing in one almighty God is not sufficient. You should also worship only one almighty God. And only if you believe and worship almighty God, who is one, will universal brotherhood prevail. Without the concept of one almighty God, brotherhood and humanity cannot prevail in the full world. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, that revile not those people, abuse not those people who worship God besides Allah, lest in their ignorance they will revile Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 1, which says, Ya yuwanna suttaku rabbakum allazi khalakum min nafsiyu, waida khalaka minha zawjaha, that O humankind, reverence your guardian Lord, who has created you from a single person and created like nature his mate and has scattered like seeds countless men and women. Wakhru dawan alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Now we would have the presumably more interesting session, the question answer session. Advocate Prabhakar Rao Hegde, Advocate Hingorani, DCP Saxena, distinguished guests present here today, our elders, brothers and sisters. We would, after the question answer session, request our distinguished guests to present their impressions on the topic and their comments. Advocate Hegde, Advocate Hingorani, and DCP Saxena kindly requested after the question answer session to pass your comments so we have a better interaction of the session. To derive more benefit for all of us present here today, in the limited time we have available, we would like you to follow the following rules in the question answer session. Questions asked should be on the topic universal brotherhood only or on Islam and comparative religion in context. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. This is a question answer time and not a lecture time. Only one question at a time may be put forward to the speakers at your designated mic. For your second question, you would have to queue up again at the mic for your second chance. Three mics have been provided in the auditorium for the questions. 
two just next to the stage for the brothers, one on my right and one on the left, and one up above in the balcony for the sisters. Written questions on slip papers would be given secondary preference after the questions on the mics have been handled. The volunteers would be having slips of papers. If you don't have them with you, you could ask them for it and pass on the slips right up to the stage through the volunteers. Kindly state your name and profession before putting forward your question to get a more appropriate response. Non-Muslim guests would be given first preference in putting forward their questions. I would request the volunteers at the mic to kindly handle that aspect. We will allow one question on each of the mics in clockwise rotation. One here on the mic uh, below the stage, the next that side, and one up on the sister's side, and so on. Yes, brother. Thank you, Dr. Naik, for your lucid explanation of Islam's concept of God. My simple question is, you have talked about racial brotherhood, linguistic brotherhood, blood brotherhood, and so on, and they are the disturbers of the concept of universal brotherhood. But you have not talked on the concept of kafir, I think which is one of the most important disturbers of universal brotherhood in the world. Can I have your name, brother? So that I can answer you in a better way. Yes. Professor Nigar from Biwandi College. The professor has asked a question that I have spoken about various concepts. I've explained the concept of universal brotherhood and spoken that the concept of brotherhood based on blood relationship, on race, on caste and creed, etc., they cause disturbance. I haven't spoken on the concept of kafir. Brother kafir is an Arabic word which comes from the root word kafir, which means to conceal, to conceal, to hide. It also means to reject. And in context, in Islamic context, it means that any person who conceals or rejects the truth of Islam, anyone who rejects the truth of Islam is called as a kafir. Anyone who rejects the truth of Islam, that there's one God and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all that I spoke, he's a kafir. Any brotherhood, besides the brotherhood of universal brotherhood of faith, and the Islamic Brotherhood, if it falls in other brotherhood based on anything, there can be a hundred types of brotherhood. Brotherhood based on a particular region, whether it be India, whether it be Pakistan, whether it be America, all these other brotherhood that is not in the purview of the brotherhood of faith, believing in the concept of one God, disturb the universal brotherhood, including if you say that the Kafirs, the brotherhood of Kafirs, do they disturb? Yes, they disturb. What is the meaning of kafir? Anyone who rejects the truth of Islam. There are some non-Muslims who ask me questions, and during question answer, I'm one of the cassettes, they said, that why do the Muslims abuse us by calling kafir? And people say that they get hurt. I said, see, kafir is an Arabic word, which means a person who rejects the truth of Islam. It's an Arabic word. For a person who rejects the truth of Islam, in English, if you have to translate, he becomes a non-Muslim. So a person who's a non-Muslim who rejects the truth of Islam, he is called as a kafir. It's just a translation of the English word non-Muslim. So if you say that don't call a non-Muslim a kafir, how can I do that? So if a person says, why do you call me a kafir? Don't call me a kafir. So I can tell that you accept Islam and stop calling a kafir. It's only an Arabic word for non-Muslim. Hope that answers the question. Yeah. Dr. Naik, I'm advocate Madhav Farke. You said in your speech that uh, God is, um, Allah is imageless and formless, as stated in Hinduism. Then why Muslims during Hajj pilgrimage, they worship uh, holy shrine as a Hindu, they worship? That's a very good question the brother has posed. That if Almighty God has got no image in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no form, then why do the Muslims they worship the holy shrine referring to the Kaaba in Hajj pilgrimage? Whether it's a misconception, no Muslim ever worships the Kaaba. It's a misconception among the non-Muslims that we Muslims, 
we worship the Kaaba. No Muslim worship the Kaaba. We only worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, who we cannot see in this world. What we do is that Kaaba is the Qibla. Qibla in Arabic means the direction. Kaaba is the Qibla because we Muslims we believe in unity, always unity. For example, if we want to pray to Almighty God, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, if we have to offer salah, some may say, let's face the north. Some may say, let's face south. Some may say east. Some may say west. Where do we face? We believe in unity. So for unity, all the Muslims throughout the world, they are asked to face in the direction of the Qibla, that is the Kaaba. It's a direction. We don't worship it. And the first people who do the world map were the Muslims. And when the Muslims do the world map, they do with the South Pole on top and North Pole down. And Kaaba was in the center. The Westerners came and they turned the map upside down. North Pole on top, South Pole down. Alhamdulillah, yet the Kaaba is in the center. Mecca is in the center. And since Mecca is in the center, any Muslim in any part of the world, if he's staying in north of Kaaba, he faces towards the south. If he's staying in the south of Kaaba, he faces towards the north. All the Muslims throughout the world, they face in one direction. Kaaba is the Qibla, it's the direction. No Muslim ever worships it. And when we go for Hajj, to the pilgrimage, we circumambulate around the Kaaba. We circumambulate around the Kaaba because everyone knows that all circles have only one center. So we circumambulate around the Kaaba to testify that there is only one God. Not because we worship it. And the statement of the second Khalifa of Islam, Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, it's mentioned in Sai Muslim, in the book of Hajj, volume number two, he said, Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, that I am kissing the black stone, that is the Kaaba, Sangha Swad, only because my prophet kissed it. Otherwise, this black stone can neither harm me, neither can it benefit me. The second Khalifa of Islam, Caliph of Islam, Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he made it clear for eternity that no Muslim ever worship the black stone. It can neither benefit us, neither can it harm us. And the best example is, that during the time of the Prophet, the Sahaba, the companion of the Prophet, they even stood on the Kaaba and gave the Azan. Azan is the call for prayers. People stood on the Kaaba and gave the Azan. I am asking you, which idol worshipper will ever stand on the idly worships? So these are sufficient proof that no Muslim ever worship the Kaaba. Kaaba is the Qibla and we worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who we cannot see with eyes. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. I am Dr. Vyas, a medical practitioner. <clears throat> we came here for having views on universal brotherhood. We did not come here for a Baudhik on Islam. I would request you to tell us about brotherhood in this world. Now, this is universal brotherhood. I would like to know whether there are brothers in other parts of the universe. We have brothers in India. So we talk of Indian brotherhood and how brotherhood in this country has affected the history of this country during the last 100 years. The brother asked a very good question, a very relevant question. He said that, you know, he has come here to hear about universal brotherhood. And what I spoke is about the brotherhood of the world only. And are we brothers in other parts of the universe? Brother is a doctor, alhamdulillah. And if you heard my talk, if you paid attention to it, brother, I said that we believe in Almighty God, who is the Lord of the worlds, Rabbil Alameen. Lord of the worlds means Lord of the universe besides this world. Yes, brother, yes, brother. If you hear my answer, I'll reply to him and then I'll come to your question. You're most welcome. I'm here. I will reply to everyone, inshallah. First, I'll just reply to the elderly gentleman. He has asked a question. It's my pleasure to reply. He said, talk about brotherhood. That's the brotherhood. And universal brotherhood means not only brotherhood of this world, but of the worlds, of the whole universe. And according to the glorious Quran, in Surah Shura, chapter number 42, verse number 29, 
It says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the heavens and the earth and has put creatures between them. That means the Quran says that there are living creatures beside this world. There are living creatures beside this world. Science hasn't reached that far to prove that there is life besides this earth. You know, scientists are sending rockets and satellites and spaceships to try and prove there's life on Mars, etc. It's not established. They say there are high chances. But the Quran says there is life besides this earth. And I believe in it. So universal brotherhood doesn't only mean brotherhood in this world. It means brotherhood even in the other worlds, as you rightly said. Even brotherhood in India. Even brotherhood in India throughout the world. And for this brotherhood to prevail, if you heard my talk, I don't repeat the full talk again, that there should be a moral conduct. That no human being should kill any other human being. He should not rob. He should give charity. He should love his neighbors. He should not backbite. He should see to it that when he sleeps with a full stomach, even his neighbors is fed well. He should see to it that he does not have alcohol. Alcohol prevents the brotherhood to prevail in the world. He should not backbite. He should not slander anyone. All these things promote universal brotherhood, not only in India, not only in the world, in the full universe. May be possible that you did not pay attention to some portions of my talk. My talk, alhamdulillah, was focused on the topic. And it did cover India, America, full world, as well as the universe. And this can only take place in all the religions if you believe in the concept that the creator of all the human beings, of all the creatures, whether in India or whether in America or whether outside this world, is one almighty God. And all the religions basically speak in belief of one God, which I discussed in detail. For more details about concept of God, I have given this talk, concept of God in major religion. It speaks more about the concept of God in other religions like Sikhism and Parsism, etc. And it deals in detail. If a person wants to have more knowledge on how it can prevail, you can avail of my cassette concept of God in major religion. It's available for sale outside in the fire. Yes, brother. Satyapal Malani Ullas Nagar. I think Dr. Zakir is playing with verse. It's jugglery of verse only. Islam divides peoples of the whole world in two. One is Momin and there is a Kafir. Definitely we don't believe and trust in many things which Islam says. So this brother out of universal brotherhood is not possible what Islam wants to enjoin upon us. Islam only creates divisive forces. Even we can know Shias, Sunnis and 70 other castes in Islam itself. Uh, I'm putting the question. No problem. Universal, but Islam cannot give universal brotherhood. It's only Hinduism which can give universal brotherhood. Ekam Satya Vipra Bahuda Vadanti, which you have just quoted. Islam does not recognize Killing the cows, killing the kafirs, taking their property, loot, women folk, Islam tells. How brotherhood can come? And you talk of brotherhood is a jugglery of words only. Really speaking, you are talking Hinduism in the name of Islam. The brother has made several comments. And Islam says, In the sabreen. For verily, Allah is with those who are patient. For brotherhood to prevail, you should be patient. If I'm not patient, there'll be a fight between me and my brother. Islam says, <laughs> in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 153, Inna Allah sabreen. For verily, Allah is with those who are patient. And for brother to prevail, you should be patient. And I, I respect my elderly brother out here. He may be having a good study of Hinduism. But I'm sorry that I disagree with him. His study of Islam is a bit weak, I would say. And I do agree with him that Islam, there are two types of people. One is a believer, Mormon, and the other, he said, is a kafir, according to him. In every religion, there are two types of people. Even Hinduism, a Hindu and a non-Hindu. In Christianity, Christian and non-Christian. In Judaism, 
a Jew and a non-Jew. In Islam, a Muslim and non-Muslim. So where does Islam differ? And I'm not here to criticize Hinduism. I'm not here to criticize Hinduism. But since you're a learned speaker, I would like to speak on Hinduism because I am a student of comparative studies. I've read the Vedas, I've read the Upanishads. But if just for a small comment, according to the Vedas it mentioned that the humankind has been created from four parts of Almighty God. From the head, it is the Brahman. From the chest, it is the Kshatriyas. From the thigh, it is the Vaishas, the business class. And from the feet, it is the Shudra, caste system. I'm not here to comment on these, brother. I wouldn't like to. I wouldn't like to hurt the feelings of my Hindu brother. Islam doesn't agree with that. I didn't comment on those things. I didn't criticize any religion. I didn't criticize any religion. I didn't say that this religion is wrong. But you, if you know your Veda very well, you should testify to the audience. Doesn't the Veda say that from the head you have the Brahmins, from the chest you have the Kshatriya, from the thighs you have the Vaisha, the business class, learned class, warrior class, business class, Shudras. The Shudras are supposed to be downtrodden. And there are books written by Dr. Ambedkar. I don't want to go into the details, brother. Hinduism, I have learned very well. I respect many aspects of Hinduism. Certain aspects, I don't agree. I have to say because they have forced me to say. Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 108, Revile not those who worship God besides Allah, lest in their ignorance they will revile Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What I spoke is the positive aspect of Hinduism. That is, they believe in the concept of one God. Regarding a question that, you know, the Muslims, they keep on killing people, they keep on killing cow, you said. Correct? You said that. See, every allegation requires an answer. So time doesn't permit. I'll just pick up a few. Any other, you can come next and ask. I'm here to clarify the misconception. It's my pleasure. Only if I clarify the misconception will the person understand Islam better. Therefore, in our sessions, we always have a question and session. And we welcome. When anyone criticizes us, I love it. The more a person criticizes and more is logically convinced, will he understand Islam better? That's what I do. Islam said, spread the message of truth. With hikmah, the Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125, That is, invite all the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Regarding the concept of can we have non-veg, talking about killing cows, etc. And there are many non-Muslims who say, you know, you Muslims, you all are ruthless people, you all kill animals. Just for your information, brother, a Muslim can be a very good Muslim even by being a pure vegetarian. It's not compulsory that he should have non-veg to be a good Muslim. But since the Quran says in several places, you can have the cattle, why we shouldn't have? The Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 1, it says that, Ya yo ladina amunu, O you believe, fulfill all your obligations, and lawful for you are all four-footed animals with the exception named Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 5, that Allah has created for you cattle, which are his signs, from it you derive warmth, and there are various benefits in it, and of the meat you can eat. Quran repeats this in Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse 21, you can eat the meat of the cattle. You know, in non veg there are doctors available here, even I'm a medical doctor, it's rich in protein, it's rich in iron, and it's very nutritious. In the other food, the level of protein which you get in non-veg, you cannot get in any other vegetarian food. Soya bean, which is supposed to be the best form of protein in vegetable, it comes nowhere close to the non-veg protein. And regarding the concept of killing of cows, if you read the Hindu scriptures, I'm not here to criticize any religion, but brother asks a question, I have to speak the truth. It permits a person to have non-veg, if you read the Hindu scriptures, the sages and sons, they had non-veg. They even had beef. It is later on due to the influence, like Jainism, etc., that people were being influenced in the philosophy of Ahimsa, of not to kill animals. That they accepted this philosophy in their way of life. Otherwise, Islam is also for animal rights. I can give a talk only on animal rights. Islam is the religion which says they do not overburden the animals. Treat them nicely, give them food. But when required, they are even created for food. If you analyze the other religions which believe in the philosophy that you should not have non-veg, the philosophy was based on the concept that you should not kill animals. 
because they're living creatures. Therefore, having non-veg is a sin. I do agree with them. If any human being can live in this world without killing a single living creature, I would be the first one. The universal brotherhood in Hinduism is that every living creature is your brother. Every living creature, irrespective whether it's an animal or a bird or an insect. I'm asking a simple question that how can a person even survive for five minutes without killing millions of his brothers? Those who know medical science will understand what I'm saying. That whenever you breathe, there are millions of germs you're inhaling and you're killing. That means in this religion, you're killing your brothers to survive. The universal brotherhood in Islam is every human being is your brother. Brotherhood in faith is every Muslim is a brother. Every living creature is not my brother. But we have to protect the living creature, should not harm them, should not unnecessarily torture them. But when required, you can have them for food. So when the philosophy says that having non veg is a sin because we kill living creatures, today science tells us that even the plants have got life. Do you know that? So the logic that killing living creatures is a sin has failed. So now, now they change the logic and they say that, see, plants have got life, but plants can't feel pain. Therefore, killing the animals is a greater sin as compared to killing plants. Do you know, today science has advanced and we have come to know even the plants can feel pain. The plants can even cry. The plant even feel happy. So the logic that plants cannot feel pain has failed. What the thing, the cry of the plant cannot be heard by the human ear because the human ear has a frequency of 20 cycles per second to 20,000 cycles per second. Anything between this, the human ear can hear. Anything below or above, the human ear can't hear. For example, if a master blows a dog whistle, you know the dog whistle, it's called a silent dog whistle. It blows the whistle, which has a frequency of above 20,000 cycles and below 40,000 cycles per second. The dog can hear up to 40,000 cycles per second. So when the master blows the whistle, the dog hears the whistle, but the human being don't hear. It's called as a silent dog whistle. Similarly, the cry giving out the plant cannot be heard by the human being, but they also cry. They also feel pain. There was a brother of us who argued with Maximum, and he told me that, Brother Zakir, I agree with you that the plants have got life, they can feel pain, but you know, the plants have got two senses less. They only have three senses. The animals have got five senses. Therefore, killing an animal is a greater sin as compared to killing a plant. So I told him, brother, suppose you have a younger brother who is born deaf and dumb, two senses less. After he grows up, if someone goes and kills him, will you tell the judge, oh me lord, give the murderer less punishment because my brother had two senses less? Will you say that? You will say, may Lord give him double punishment because he killed a person who was innocent. So in Islam, the logic doesn't work like that, two senses or three senses. Islam says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 168, eat of the good things that we have provided for you. That means whatever is good and lawful, you can have. And that's the reason if you analyze the cattle in the world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his way, Almighty God. The reproduction of the cattle is very fast as compared to reproduction of the other animals and the human beings. They reproduce very fast. If I agree with you that no human being should have any cattle, then we will have overpopulation of cattle in the world. And regarding killing of cows, there's a book written by Maulana Abdul Karim Parekh, Gao Hatya, Cow Slaughter, Who is to Blame? And we'll analyze the people that deal in leather, leather of cows, more non-Muslim than Muslims. Leather, the gents, they deal in that. So the people who are responsible to benefit from the cow slaughter are not the Muslims, the more of them are non-Muslims. So if you know history well, and if you know logic also well, you'll understand that Allah says, eat of the good things we have provided for you. If you can have, there's no problem. And besides that, if you analyze the set of teeth of the herbivorous animal, the cow, the goat, the sheep, they only have vegetables. They have a flat set of teeth. If you analyze the set of teeth of the carnivorous animal, the lion, the tiger, the leopard, they have got sharp pointed teeth. They can only have non-veg. If you analyze the set of teeth of the human, means if you go in the mirror and look at your teeth, 
We have pointed teeth as well as sad teeth. If Almighty God wanted us to have only vegetables, why did He give us this pointed teeth? For what? To have non veg. If you analyze the digestive system of the herbivorous animal, the cow, the goat, the sheep, they have a digestive system which can only digest vegetables. The digestive system of the carnivorous animal, the lion, the tiger, the leopard, they can only digest non veg. The digestive system of the human beings can digest both non veg and veg. If Almighty God wanted us to have only vegetables, why did He give us a digestive system that can digest both veg and non veg? So, scientifically, if you analyze, Almighty God wanted us to have both veg as well as non veg. Hope that answers the question. If you have any queries, any other misconception, brother, it's my pleasure to reply. One misconception at a time so that I can do justice to each other misconception. Thank you, brother. Yes, sir. Hello, Dr. Naik Saab. Here, the most important thing is most people in English. And here, all of you have read the books that you can only speak English. Most people, those who have been lecturing or speaking, they should be speaking in local language. Excuse me, brother. Excuse me. Let me coordinate. Uh, we have been called here, Zakir has been invited by the organizers here to give a talk in English and have a question answer. That what questions you have to address, I would request you to kindly after the program address to the organizers. Question mera baki hai. Huh. Question mera baki hai. Ah, so you put forward a question. Urdu mein bhi da, agar aap question uh, put forward karenge, inshallah, agar uh, speaker usko, he'll explain English and answer it. Nahi bura hai bed aur sastar, nahi Quran bura hai. Bina samji baate aur be samja vakhyan bura hai. समझो तुम अपनी बातों और सबका ध्यान बुरा है अपने अपने हिसाब से सोचो कि उस प्रभु का सम्मान नहीं बुरा है और यूनिवर्सल ब्रदरहुड के पहले से जहां भी कोई बातें होनी चाहिए वहां पर मजहब की कोई बात नहीं होनी चाहिए मजहब से ऊपर उठकर बात होनी चाहिए क्यों मजहब से ऊपर उठना ही उस अल्लाह ताला को पा, पाना है उस परमात्मा को पाना है और पहले गॉड का मीनिंग समझो कि गॉड का मीनिंग क्या है गॉड गॉडेस कुछ नहीं होता है G.O.D. That super power is controlling the nature and that nature is having three parts. G.O.D. God. G for generator, O for operator, D for destroyer. That nature is generating us, that nature is operating us, that nature is destroying us. We are being generated, we are being operated, we are being destroyed. Is my goddess or God ka meaning kuch bhi nahi hai or God ka asli meaning kuch bhi nahi hai. Allah ta'ala God se upar hai, Parmeshwar God se upar hai, Parvardigar God se upar hai. Thank you very much, brother. The brother has summarized my lecture in a very short way, alhamdulillah. I thank him. He rightly said there is no God and Goddess. That's what I explained. He explained in Hindi so that those who don't understand English can understand. I would like to thank you, brother. He explained very well. There is no God, there is no Goddess. Allah ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is superior. And I agree with him. Thank you, brother. And he rightly said that there should not be different religions. I agree with you. There should not be different religions. Because Quran says, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, in Nadina in the Islam, the only way of life acceptable is the person who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I agree with you, brother, that if you fight amongst yourself in religion, there's bound to be differences. And there should be no differences. And the brother also made certain comments that Shias, etc., and different religion, and the 73 firqas. I can give that answer. It requires time. If you want to know the answer, you can pose it. I'll give you the reply for that also. Why? talking about different firqas, etc. But the brother rightly says that there should be only one religion, one way of life. And that is submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you believe in that, there has to be universal brotherhood. If you don't believe in that, there is bound to be disharmony. Thank you very much, brother. Uh, what we'll start, we'll start asking one question on the slip. And if anyone would like to ask questions, you, uh, I'd request them kindly stand at the mic so we can put forward the question. Okay, we'll allow the gentleman there to ask the question. Any sister would like to ask some question, I request you to kindly stand at the mic. If no one is standing at the mic, I assume the question is not going to come from the mic. And I move forward to the next clockwise question. One question from the mic, one from the slips. Yes, brother. Yes. Uh, Zakir Bhai, I have a very simple question. Your name? Uh, Professor Devray. I have not studied any religion. I don't believe in any religion. I have my simple question is, do you believe that there are different religions and there have to be different religions? Because in your lecture you said that the Allah, the God Almighty, created all the people in the world. 
men and women, and he purposely divided them into different religions, different regions, etc., etc., so that they should not fight with each other, but they should understand each other. Will you kindly explain to me the purpose of the Crusades? And will you kind to, kindly explain to me your own statement that the difference between Hinduism and the Islam religion, you said that it is Hinduism and it is Islam religion. You never said that Hinduism is a religion. The difference which you stated between Hinduism and Islam religion was that Hindus believe that everything is God, while Muslims believe that everything is God's. If everything is God's, why there is so much of killing, either in India or in any other part of the whole world, even in the Muslim countries also? Thank you very much. That's a very good question. And he said that, I said in my talk, that the Almighty God has created the human being from a single pair, male and female, and I've divided into different religions. Brother, never did I say the Almighty God divided the people into different religions. It will be recorded. I never said different religions. I said you know, different nations and tribes. Races in colors, not religion. Allah says there's only one religion. Almighty God never divided the people into different religions. There's only one religion. You know, different nations and colors and variation in languages so that you may recognize each other. So that you may know, okay, this person, he comes from this particular race, from this region. Not religion, region. It is not religion. So your statement of religion is not, other things is fine. Different languages, different colors, different nations, I agree with that. So that they may recognize each other, not that they should fight amongst each other. You said that, I never mentioned that Hinduism is a religion. I again disagree with you. I said religion is a belief in Almighty God, or Oxford Dictionary. To understand Hinduism, to understand the religion of Hinduism, you have to understand the concept of God. To understand the religion of Judaism, you have to understand the concept of God in Judaism. To understand the religion of Christianity, you have to understand the concept of God in Christianity. To understand the religion of Islam, you have to understand the concept of God in Islam. That's what I said. Regarding differences, who has created? Not Almighty God. Allah clearly says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 159, anyone who breaks the religion into sects, Allah has nothing to do with him. You cannot divide the religion. Anyone who divides is in the wrong. You ask me, why are people killing each other? You have to, have to ask them. Suppose, as a teacher, you tell the people, don't copy. And yet they copy. Who's to blame, the teacher or the student? The student. Here, Almighty God has given a free will to the human beings that you can do what you want. I've given you guidance. The last and final guidance, the last and final revelation is the glorious Quran. The do's and do's is mentioned here. And Allah says, and I mentioned in my talk in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 32. If anyone kills a human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, whether it be Hindu, Jew, Christian, Sikh, anyone, unless it be for murder or for spreading mischief in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of human race. If he saves any human being, it is as though he has saved the whole of humanity. So God Almighty doesn't like people killing each other. But if human beings don't want to follow, who's to blame? The human beings. So this world, the Quran says in Surah Mulk, chapter 16, verse number 2, that this world, Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. Allah doesn't interfere. If he wants, he can. The Quran says if Allah wanted, he could have made all the people believe. But then where is the test? If the teacher wants, he can easily pass all those students irrespective of whether they fail. Teacher can, but that will be passed. Then where is the free will of the student? If they are undergoing a test and if someone doesn't give a right answer, yet the teacher passes, then a person who has studied hard will object that I clocked so much for the examination, this person is copying and is cheating, he writes the wrong answer and you pass him. So next batch, if the people realize that teacher passes everyone irrespective of whether you give right answer or wrong answer, then everyone will stop studying. Then you may get a degree, a medical degree. But that doctor, when he passes his medical, when he comes out, he will not cure the people, he will kill the people. 
So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the guidelines in the glorious Quran. Do not kill, do not harm others, love people, love your neighbors, all that is talk. But if people don't do, that means they are not following the Quran. Let it be anyone. Let it be anyone, whether it be America, whether it be Pakistan, whether it be any country in the world. People may say, see, just by calling yourself a Muslim name, Abdullah or Zakir or Muhammad, you don't get a ticket to Jannah. Just by saying that you are a Muslim doesn't make you a Muslim. Muslim is not a label that, okay, if I say I'm Muslim, I'm Muslim. Muslim means a person who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just by calling a person Zakir, Abdullah, Muhammad, Shakir, these people, if they act, if they submit their will to Allah, then they are Muslims. By calling themselves Muslims, as the Quran says, there are some people who are lip service Muslim. So if people are killing, they are not following the guidance of the Quran. If they follow the guidance of the Quran, peace will prevail throughout the world. Hope they answer the question. So Zakir Bhai, if a Hindu follows the principles of Quran, which are very similar to the principles given in the various Hindu religious books. Can a Hindu call himself as a Muslim? Or on the other hand, can a Muslim call himself as a Hindu? Because you are, the very topic of your lecture is universal brotherhood. I properly understood Dr. Vax when he asked his question. Very good question. Brother, if you ask a clear question, I can give a reply, alhamdulillah. But that's a very good question. Can a Hindu following the principles of Islam in the Quran and Hinduism be called as a Muslim? And can a Muslim be called as a Hindu? Very good. Let's understand the definition of the word Muslim and a Hindu. As I said, Muslim is a person who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. What's the definition of the word Hindu? Do you know? Hindu is a geographical definition. Anyone living in India, anyone living on this side of the Indus Valley civilization, He's a Hindu. By definition, I'm a Hindu. Do you know that? <laughs> Hindu is a geographical definition. You ask anyone. According to Swami Vivekananda, Hindu is a misnomer. Geographically, I'm an Indian. I'm a Hindu geographically. But Swami Vivekananda said that they should be called as Vedantists. They should not be called Hindus. Vedantists. So if you ask me, Am I geographically Hindu? Yes, I am geographically Hindu. I am. But if you ask me, am I following the Vedas? I said that those parts of the Vedas which conciliate with the glorious Quran, I have got no objection following those parts. For example, that there is one God. But if you say I believe that Almighty God created the Brahmin from the head, a different caste, which are superior caste, the Kshatriyas from the chest, it's Veda I am quoting. If you don't believe in the Veda, it's your problem, brother. But this is the Veda I'm quoting. You can ask the scholars of Vedic scholars, they are sitting here. They are sitting here. Vedas say that, not I. The Vaishyas from the thighs and the Sudras from the feet. So I don't agree with this concept. That's right. So if you ask me, do you believe in the philosophy of Veda? I say no. This particular philosophy. According to you, anybody who inhabits this land is a Hindu. Yes. Yes, geographically said that. Yes, brother rightly said that anyone who inhabits India has to be Hindu, but natural. Anyone living in America is a citizen of America, he has to be American. Very good. Alhamdulillah. So, anyone living. Yes. That's it. I agree with you, brother. Geographically, everyone living in India is a Hindu. So I completely agree with it. By the geographical definition, if you say, if you say that anyone who lives in India is Hindu, it's correct. Any scholar will agree, anyone living in India is Hindu, geographically I'm a Hindu. But because I stay in India, can I be a Muslim? Yes. Of course. Can a Muslim be a Hindu? Yes. If the Muslim is living in India, he can be a Hindu. But if a so-called Hindu lives in America, he's not a Hindu. You know that? He's an American. So Hinduism cannot be called a universal religion, according to the scholars. Hindu is the religion of India only. It's not a religion. It's a geographical definition. According to Swami Vivekananda, who's a great scholar, he said Hinduism is a misnomer. You know misnomer? Misnomer means a wrong label given. They should be called as Vedantists.
So if you ask me, am I a Hindu? I will tell you, if Hindu is a person living in India, by all means I'm a Hindu. But if you say Hindu is a person who worships, as the person said, you know, that if you believe in so-and-so gods, we have got forms, etc., and we have got heads and hands, etc., then I'm not a Hindu. But if you mean a geographical definition, yes, I'm a Hindu. Similarly, can a Hindu be a Muslim? Yes, a Indian can be a Muslim. A Hindu can be a Muslim. But if that Indian, if that Indian does idol worship, he can't be a Muslim. Because the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 48 and Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 116 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never forgives the sin of committing shirk, associating partners. Any other sin if he wishes, he may forgive. But shirk he'll never forgive. So an Indian living in India, geographical Hindu, can be a Muslim. But if that geographical Hindu, Indian, breaks any commandments, that is, the basics of concept of God, believe in Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Then he cannot be a Muslim. Any Muslim who follows the Quran and lives in India, he is an Indian Muslim. Hope it's very clear for you. He is a Hindu Muslim. <laughs> Two things I want to make very clear. First, you might have, uh, might not have properly heard me, uh, brother. Uh, I think as far as the question answer session goes. We'll allow normally one question, you put your question completely as a question rather no, no. than lecture and let the speaker answer. After the question answer session is over, after the program is over and when others who might not be interested in discussion, we'll welcome discussion after the program so everyone else is not blocked up on one question and we give opportunities to many other people. We will allow. Yes, sir. Uh, Advocate Hector. Hey, question, answer, wow. Debate ho ne. आपण जे करता है ते डिबेट च्या पद्धतीने करता है नंतर त्याच्यावर तो रोष करता जर कोणाला प्रश्न विचारले त्याची उत्तर स्पीकर देतील प्रश्नांची जी उत्तर आम्हाला मिळाली त्यामुळे आमचं समाधान झालं नाही मग आपण बसावं खाली दुसऱ्याला प्रश्न विचारला नाही ठीक आहे त्याचे काही हरकत नाही आम्हाला फक्त प्रश्न असा आहे आणखी एक आता एक प्रश्न मी विचारतो एक्सक्यूज मी ब्रदर की इज ब्रदर एक्सक्यूज मी आई विल पुट फॉरवर्ड द क्वेश्चन ऑन द स्लिप मिस्टर मेतास व्हाय आर मोस्ट ऑफ द मुस्लिम्स Fundamentalists and terrorists. The question posed is by Brother Mehta, why are most of the Muslims fundamentalists and terrorists? The question is posed, I give the answer. If you like it, you take it. If you don't like it, leave it. Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 256, like Deen, there is no compulsion religion, truth stands out clear from error. I present the truth to you. If you like it, you take it. If you don't like it, you reject it. No problem. There is no compulsion in religion. Like Rahaf al-Din. Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 256. Brother Mehta has asked a question that why are most of the Muslims fundamentalists? Why are they terrorists? What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? Fundamentalist is a person who follows the fundamentals. For example, a person to be a good mathematician, he should know, he should follow, and practice the fundamentals of maths. He should be a fundamentalist in the field of maths to be a good mathematician. For a person to be a good scientist, he should know, he should follow, and practice the fundamentals of science. He should be a fundamentalist in the field of science to be a good scientist. For a person to be a good doctor, he should know, he should follow, and practice the fundamentals of medicine. He should be a fundamentalist in the field of medicine to be a good doctor. You cannot paint all fundamentalists with the same brush. You can't say all fundamentalists are bad or all fundamentalists are good. For example, you have a fundamentalist robber who's expert in the field of robbing. But he's harmful for the society. He robs the people and doesn't promote brotherhood. He is not a good human being. On the other hand, you have a fundamentalist doctor who follows and practices the fundamentals of medicine and he cures the sickness of human beings. He is a good person. He helps the human being. So you can't paint all fundamentalists with the same brush. Regarding Muslim the fundamentalist, I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim because I know, I follow, and alhamdulillah strive to practice the fundamentals of Islam. I'm proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim, and every Muslim, to be a good Muslim, should be a fundamentalist Muslim. Otherwise, he can't be a good Muslim. Every Hindu, to be a good Hindu, 
He should be a fundamentalist Hindu, otherwise he will not be a good Hindu. Every Christian, to be a good Christian, he should be a fundamentalist Christian, otherwise he won't be a good Christian. Regarding is a fundamentalist Muslim good or bad? That is the question. Alhamdulillah, the fundamentals of Islam. There is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity. So far, many of the brothers pose certain questions because of the misconception. Because of the misconception, you may think that this teaching of Islam is wrong. Like brother said, having cow is wrong and I gave the answer. Brother said about certain things and I gave the answer. So person who has lack of knowledge, he may think that there are certain fundamentals of Islam which are wrong. But if anyone who has the knowledge of Islam, there is not a single teaching of Islam which goes against humanity, goes against society. I challenge anyone, not only in this audience, in the full universe, to point out to me a single, a single teaching of Islam which is against the basics of humanity. Single. Some people may feel bad, but as a whole, the teaching of Islam is best for universal brotherhood to promote humanity. There is not a single teaching and I challenge again. Anyone from the audience, they can ask me questions. I will clarify the misconception. Inshallah, when the time comes, there's the next question you can pose. One question at a time. When your turn was there, you don't reply. See, the thing is that you have to follow certain rules. The mic was empty for half an hour. No one came up. I told the brother, you're most welcome. You stand on the mic, no one comes. You can keep on asking one-one question. Every third question will be your question. No problem. You can ask as many as, as much as the time the auditorium has been hired for. There's no problem. So, I'm proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. But if you read the definition of fundamentalism, in the Webster Dictionary, it says that fundamentalism was a movement which was started in the early 20th century by a group of Christians, the Protestants in America, who protested and said, that not only is the Bible, the teaching of the Bible the word of God, but every letter of the Bible is verbatim the word of God. So the fundamentalism was first used for a group of Protestant Christians in America who protested and said that every letter, word of the Bible is the word of God. If any human being who can prove that every word of the Bible is the word of God, then the movement is good. But if someone can prove that every word of the Bible is not the word of God, then the movement is not a good movement. But if you read the Oxford Dictionary, what is the meaning of the word fundamentalism? Fundamentalism, according to Oxford Dictionary, means strictly adhering to ancient laws of any religion, especially Islam. In Oxford Dictionary, they write especially Islam. The word especially Islam is there in the latest edition of Oxford Dictionary. That means fundamentalist immediately think of a Muslim. Why? The media is bombarding people that you know that these Muslims, they are fundamentalists, they are terrorists. The moment you think they were a fundamentalist, immediately people start thinking of a Muslim. Start thinking of the word terrorist. What is the meaning of the word terrorist? A terrorist is a person who causes terror. Who causes terror. And sometimes for peace to prevail, you may have to cause terror. When a robber sees the police, he's terrified. So for the robber, the police is a terrorist. Right or wrong? I'm speaking English. I'm not playing on with words. I'm speaking English. Terrorist is the person who causes terror. So for the robber, for the criminal, for the antisocial element, the police is a terrorist. In this context, every Muslim should be a terrorist. In context. Should be a terrorist for the antisocial element. Whenever an antisocial element sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Any robber sees a Muslim, you should be terrified. Any rapist sees a Muslim, you should be terrified. But I do agree that terrorist is a word normally used for terrorizing the common people, the innocent people. In this context, no Muslim should be a terrorist. He should not terrorize the innocent people. But where anti-social elements are concerned, where robbers are concerned, where criminals are concerned, as policemen are terrorists to the criminals, even the Muslim should be a terrorist to the criminal. And if you analyze, many a times, two different labels are given to the same person for his same activity. For example, you know, there were many Indians who fought for the freedom of India. When the Britishers ruled India, there were many Indians who fought for the freedom of India. The Britishers called them as terrorists. Ah, these people are terrorists. But we Indians 
We call these freedom fighters as patriots. Right or wrong? Patriots. They fought for the freedom of the country. Same people, same activity, two different labels. The Britishers called them as terrorists. The Indian citizens called them as patriots, freedom fighters. Same activity, same person, two different labels. So before you give a label, you should first analyze that which view do you adhere to. If you agree with the British view that the British government had a right to rule over India, then you would call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the Indian citizens that the Britishers, they came to do business and they started ruling us unlawfully, then you'll call these people as freedom fighters. So before you give any label to any particular person, you should analyze which view do you have? Same people can be given two different views by different people. In this context, I would say every Muslim should be a fundamentalist where Islam is concerned. Because every teaching of Islam promotes human values and humanity and universal brotherhood. Hope that answers the question. I am Dr. Devre from Bhivendi College. Well, Every religion is a supreme science of life. Nothing is wrong so far as the principles of religions are concerned. But the formulation of principles is a different thing and execution of these principles is a different thing. Actually, where there is no relationship of blood, the relationship is to be established by the religions. Actually, what we find, I quote, La Tufasidu Filar Jai Bada Isallah. Is Sansar me Shanti Prastapit Hone ke Bad, a Shanti Mat Pailao, a Paigam Hame Mila hai. But actually, what we find, what we realize, what we experience is this the maximum blood is wasted only on account of the conflicts in the religions. So where is the wrong? I mean, what are your views about this? How would you reconcile the principles of religion and this chaos which arises on account of religion? What are your views on, on this particular aspect? The professor asked a very good question that in all religion basically speak good thing, but the implementation may be different. They teach good things. But today you see in the world many people are fighting on the name of religion. How can you solve this problem? It's a very good question. And part of the answer I gave in my talk. And I said that as far as Islam is concerned, we should not kill any human being. So in Maida chapter 5 verse 32. How can you see to it that we can come to common terms? How can we solve the differences? That also I mentioned in my talk. In Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, which says that Tala will akalmitin sawa im bainam bainakum. That come to common terms as in us and you. If suppose you have 10 points and I have got 10 points. If out of those 10 points, if 5 points are common and 5 are different, I at least agree with those 5 points which are common. The differences will come to it later on. Quran says, Tala will akalmitin sawa im bainam bainakum. That come to common terms as in us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushika bihi shayyon. That we associate no partners with him. So you rightly said how to solve. And I have given the methodology how to solve. That come to common terms. But the point to be noted here is that many people who follow religions, they do not know what their own religious scriptures speak. That is the problem. Many Muslims don't know what the Quran and Sayyidi speak. Many Hindus don't know what Hindu scriptures say. Many Christians and Jews don't know what the Bible says. Who's to blame? The followers. Therefore, I tell the people, you read your scriptures. The point of difference, we will come to it later on. At least come to the commonalities. I have given the talk on similarities between Islam and Christianity. I say the things which we differ will come to it later on. At least what your Bible and my Quran says, let's agree with those things which are common. Fight will be solved. What I'm doing now? In my talk, did I ever criticize any religion? I was forced to reply when certain brothers tried to ask certain questions, which I have to speak the truth. Otherwise, in my talk, 
you can take the video cassette. I did not criticize a single point on any religion. I never spoke about the differences. I only came to common terms. Differences, I can give a talk on differences between Islam and Hinduism. Differences between Islam and Christianity. I am a student of comparative religion. I can quote verses, Alhamdulillah, from the various world scriptures, talking about differences. I keep that when required. When someone tries to disrupt the program, we have to be well aware of these things. But I never use it in my talk. I never use it as a common man. I tell the common man, you read your scriptures, you will come closer to your scriptures and to universal brotherhood. Read your scriptures, at least first believe in one God. The difference will come to later on. The differences will come to later on. Judaism says that, Christianity says that, Hinduism says that, Islam says that, Sikhism says that, Parsim says that. Believe in one God and worship Him alone. Why do you worship other gods? Come to that point, then come to other points. If we solve this problem of commonalities, if even if there are three points common out of ten, at least agree on those common points. The other points, we can agree to disagree. We'll come to it later on. So if we come on the common points first, coming on the comparative studies, believe me, most of the problem will be solved. Believe me. And that's what I'm doing. I'm going throughout the world and I address audiences of non-Muslims and many of them because they're not aware of their scriptures, of our scriptures, many people post questions. Even Muslims aren't aware of the scriptures. So they post questions which they aren't aware of. So I educate them. I educate them about Quran, about Hadith, about Vedas, about Bible. And I quote. When I quote, I give the reference number. So no one can say, oh, Zakir is pulling a fast one. And all these scriptures are quoted. It's available in the Islamic Research Foundation. Our library has the various translations of Vedas. We have hundreds of types of Bibles. More than 30 different versions of the Bibles we have. Alhamdulillah. So whichever sect you belong to, whether you are Jehovah's Witnesses or Protestant or Catholic, I speak from their scriptures. So if you say that Zakir is wrong, you have to say that the Holy Scripture is wrong. I quote, and most of my talks are quotations. Quotations from various scriptures. If you disagree with the scriptures, that's your choice. If you want to disagree, you most of them disagree. Because Quran says, like Rafiddin, there's no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. So I'm presenting the truth of Hinduism to you. If you want to agree, agree. Do not, don't agree. There is a symposium. The third cassette from there. Symposium on concept of God on Islam, Hinduism, Christianity. People may call it a debate. The Hindu Pandit from Kerala and Calicut, a Christian father of Calicut, and I myself presented the Islamic view. Four and a half hours debate. It's available outside. Scholars of Hinduism, of Christianity, I am just a student. I'm presenting my view. And it's for the audience to judge. I'm talking about similarities. Quoting their scriptures, chapter number, verse number, chapter number, verse number. The best way to cause all the human beings to unite is find the commonalities. Speak about the differences later on. Hope that answers the question. The next question would be from the slip. Then, if there's a sister, will allow. Uh, there's one Raj Malotra. He's asking if Islam is a religion of peace, then how come it was spread by the sword? The question posed was if Islam is a religion of peace, how come it was spread by the sword? Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It also means submitting our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. In short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as I mentioned earlier, that everyone in the world does not want peace to prevail in the world. There are certain anti-social elements for their own benefits. They don't want peace to prevail. The robbers, the criminal. If peace will prevail, they will go out of business. So for their own benefit, there are certain human beings who don't want peace to prevail. So for such types of people, force may have to be used. Therefore, we have police, etc. So Islam is for peace, but sometimes you may have to use force to put the anti-social elements in their place. And the best answer to this question, that Islam was spread by the sword, is given by D. Lacey O'Leary. He's a non-Muslim historian of great repute. In his book, Islam at the Crossroad, on page number 80, says that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races, is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. Delacy O'Leary. 
page number eight, book, Islam at the Crossroad. I'm asking you a question, that we Muslims, we ruled Spain for about 800 years. Later on, the Crusaders came, and they wiped out the Muslims. There was not a Muslim who could openly give the Azan the call for prayers. We didn't use any force. You know, we Muslims, we ruled the Arab lands for about 1400 years. For a few years, the Britishers came. For a few years, the French came. But overall, the Muslims were the lordship of the Arab land for 1400 years. Do you know today, there are 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means they're Christians since generations. Since generations. If the Muslims wanted, they could have converted every non-Muslim at the point of the sword. We didn't do it. The 14 million Arabs or Coptic Christians are giving witness that Islam was inspired by the sword. You know India? India was ruled for hundreds of years by the Muslims. We didn't use the sword. We didn't use the sword. If you people do a wrong thing, you can't catch up those people and blame the religion for that. If you people don't follow the religion, you can't say that Christianity is bad because Hitler insinuated 6 million Jews. If Hitler insinuated 6 million Jews, burned 6 million Jews, you can't blame Christianity for that. There may be black sheep in every community, but we Muslims, we rule India for hundreds of years. If we wanted, we could have forced every non-Muslim to convert at the point of the sword. We didn't do it. The non-Muslims of India today, more than 80%, they are giving shahada, they are giving witness. You non-Muslims present here are giving witness that Islam was inspired by the sword. You are giving witness. We had the power, we didn't do it. Islam doesn't believe in that. Today, the country which has the maximum number of Muslims is Indonesia. Which Muslim army went to Indonesia? Which Muslim army went to Malaysia, which has 55% population of Muslims? Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Which Muslim army? Which sword? Thomas Carlyle gives the reply. Thomas Carlyle, he writes in his book, Heroes and Hero Worship, that you have to get the sword. Little good will it do that he should spread with the sword. Every new opinion initially begins in the mind of one. One man in the whole world. One man against all the human beings. It will do little good that he picks up a sword and propagates it. Which sword? Even if we had the sword, we can't use it. Even if we had the metal sword, we can't use it. Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 256, like Rahfid Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. Anyone who grasps the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and rejects the evil, he has held the most strong handhold that never breaks. Anyone who believes in Allah, Allah will take him from darkness to light. Anyone who believes in the evil, the Satan one, he will take him from lightness to dark. Which sword? Sword of the intellect. Quran says, in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125, Invite all the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. There was an article that came in the Plain Truth magazine. It was a reproduction of the Reader Digest and Manager book, 1986. It gave the statistics of the increase of the world religion between 1934 to 1984. In the 50 years, number one increase in major religion was Islam, 235%. 235%. I am asking you, which war took place between 1934 and 1984, which converted millions of non-Muslims to Islam? Which war? Do you know today, the fastest growing religion in America is Islam? Who is forcing the Americans to convert the point of the sword? The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. Who is forcing them the point of the sword? Quran gives the answer in no less than three different places. In Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33. In Surah Saf, chapter 61, verse number 9. And Surah Fatah, chapter 48, verse 28. The glorious Quran says, Huwallazi ars rasulu bilhuda wa deen al-haq liyuz hira wa ala deen kulli wa kafa billahi shayda wa qari al-mushikoon. Allah says that Allah has sent his messenger with truth and with guidance so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life. Over all the other ism, Islam is destined to supersede all, master them all, overcome them all. Kulle. Enough is Allah as a witness. And I'd like to end this answer by giving the quotation of Adam Pearson. Dr. Adam Pearson said that people who fear 
that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs, they fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. Uh, there's a question from Brother Sunni Ilyas. When Islam preaches universal brotherhood, then how come Muslims themselves are divided into sects? The question posed is that when Islam preaches universal brotherhood, how come Muslims are divided into various sects? The answer is given in the glorious Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103. It says, Wa tasimu bi hablillahi jamiyo wa la Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. Which is the rope of Allah? The glorious Quran is the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It says that the Muslims should hold to the rope of Allah, the glorious Quran and the Sahih Hadith and they should not be divided. And the Quran says as I mentioned earlier in Surah Anam chapter 6 verse 159 that anyone who divides the religion into sects, you have nothing to do with him. Allah will tell him about the affairs on the day of judgment. That means it is prohibited for anyone to make sex in the religion of Islam. But when you ask certain Muslims, what are you? Some say I'm a Hanafi, some say I'm a Shafi, some say I'm a Hamli, some say I'm a Malaki. What was the beloved Prophet? Was he Shafi? Was he Hamli? Was he Maliki? What was he? He was a Muslim. The Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 52, that Jesus, peace be upon the Muslim. The Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 67, that Abraham was a Muslim. And what is the beloved Prophet? You are the Muslim. The Quran says in Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse number 33, Woman hasan who call a mimman wa ilallahi wa amil salihum, call a inna ni minal muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites people to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says, I am of those who bow to the will of Allah, those who say, I am a Muslim. So when anyone poses the question, What are you? you should say, I am a Muslim. I have no objection if someone says I believe in certain verdicts, certain views given by great scholars like Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Ahmad Ibn Hanbal. May Allah be pleased with them all. I respect all these great scholars. If someone agrees with certain views of Imam Shafi, sometimes may Allah be pleased with him, sometimes Abu Hanifa, may Allah be pleased with him, I have got no objection. But if anyone poses the question, what are you? You should say you are a Muslim. And as the brother said earlier, that Quran says there will be 73 sects. What is referring to is saying of beloved prophet. It's mentioned in Abu Dawood, hadith number 4579. It says that the religion of Islam will be divided into 73 sects. But if you note the wording of the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Muhammad peace be upon him, he said that the religion will be divided. He didn't say you should divide the religion. He's prophesizing. Though the Quran says don't be divided, the Muslims are bound to divide. And there's another hadith. This is mentioned in Tirmidhi, hadith number 171, the beloved prophet said, there will be 73 firqas, 73 sects, and all will go to hell except for one. And the companion asked, which one? The prophet said, the one that is on the path of the prophet and the companions, one that follows the Quran and the Sai hadith. So anyone who follows the Quran and hadith is on the true path. Islam doesn't believe in division. Every person, he's a Muslim. Anyone who follows the Quran says he's a Muslim. And Islam is against dividing the religion into sects and divisions. So if you read the Quran and say Hadith, Muslims should be united on the basis of Quran and say Hadith. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. We'll allow two questions before we have the impressions of our chief guests and the presidential address by Advocate Hingorani. Yes, brother. I am a retired teacher, Lakshman Dokras Guruji. I want to ask, what is the exact remedy to increase the universal brotherhood? For which subjects we have to give priority? Either for religion or sociology or politics. Will you please tell me please kindly what is The brother asked the question that what is the priority to spread universal brotherhood? Is it religion? Is it sociology? Is it dealing with politics? Brother, I've given the talk based on that full topic. I don't have to repeat the same thing. My answer will be the same. The priority to spread universal brotherhood in all the religions is to believe in one God and worship him alone. That is the basic priority. I've repeated that in the talk. I've repeated an answer to several questions, and I'm repeating it again. 
The basic priority is not sociology or politics. That come later on. Politics deals with breath out which is limited. Sociology which is limited. Believe in one God is universal. He is the one who created all human beings, whether male or female, whether black or white, whether rich or poor. So if you believe in one God and worship him alone, then there will only be universal breath out. Hope that answers the question. The next question, I think is something connected. Uh, one brother, Prabhu is asking, all the religions basically preach good things. Uh, thus, a person can follow any one of the religion. It is one and the same. The question posed is, that all the religion basically teach good things. So, you can follow any religion, it's one and the same. And I do agree with him in the first part of the question, that all religions do basically preach good things. For example, all religions say, you should not rob, you should not molest a woman, you should not rape her. Hinduism says that, Christianity says that, Islam says that. But the difference between Islam and the other religions is, that Islam, besides speaking of good things, it shows you a way how to implement those good things. Like all religions speak about brotherhood. But Islam practically shows you, it demonstrates how to practice it in your day to day life. Salah, Hajj, etc. So Islam, besides speaking theoretically, it shows you a way how to practice it in your life. For example, Hinduism says you should not rob. Christianity says you should not rob. Islam says you should not rob. So what's the difference between Islam and the other religions? Islam shows you a way how to achieve that state in which people will not rob. Islam has a system of zakat. That is, every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that excess wealth in charity every lunar year. If every rich human being gives charity, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. After this, the glorious Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, As to the thief, be it a man or a woman, chop off his or her hand as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people may say, chopping off the hands in this age of 20th century, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless law. And I do know that there are thousands of people who rob. So if you chop off all the people, then many people lose their hands. But the law is so strict that the moment you implement it, and if a person comes to know that his hands will be chopped off if he robs, immediately the thought of robbing will go away from his mind. Do you know today America, which happens to be one of the most advanced countries in the world, unfortunately, it also has one of the highest rates of crime. Highest rate of robbery and theft. I am asking you a question. If you implement the Islamic Sharia in America, that is every rich person gives zakat, 2.5% of his excess wealth in charity, and after that, if any man or woman robs, chop off his or her hand, I am asking you a question. Will the rate of robbery and theft in America, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia and you get results. Let me give you another example. That most of the major religions say that you should not molest a woman, that you should not rape a woman. Hinduism says that, Christianity says that, Islam says the same. But Islam shows you a way how to achieve that state in which people will not, men will not molest or rape a woman. Islam has a system of hijab. People normally talk about hijab for the women. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman. The glorious Quran says in Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse number 30 that say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman and any brazen thought comes in his mind, any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. There was once a friend of mine, who was a Muslim friend, who was staring at a girl for a long time. So I told him, brother, what are you doing? It's prohibited in Islam to stare at a girl. So he told me, our beloved prophet said, that the first glance is allowed, the second is prohibited. I have not yet completed half my glance. <laughs> what did the prophet mean by saying the first glance is allowed, the second is prohibited? He didn't mean that you can look at a woman and stare continuously at her for 20 minutes without blinking. What the Prophet meant that if you look at a woman unintentionally, intentionally don't look at her again, don't feast on her. That's what the Prophet meant. 
The next verse speaks about the hijab for the woman. Surah Noor chapter 24 verse 31 says, that say to the believing woman, that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty. And display not her beauty, except what appears ordinarily of. And to draw a head covering over the bosom. And display not her beauty, except in front of her husband, her father, her son, etc. And a big list of mehram, the close relatives who she can't marry is given. And there are basically six criteria for hijab. The first is the extent which differs between the man and the woman. For the man, the extent is from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. Some scholars say even this should be covered. The remaining five criteria are the same. The second is the clothes they wear, it should not be so tight that it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be transparent so that you can see through. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. Sixth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. These are basically six criteria for hijab mentioned in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. And the Quran says in Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse number 59, giving the reason for hijab. It says, O Prophet, tell your wives and the believing women that when they go abroad, they should put on the cloak so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. Quran says, hijab has been prescribed for the woman so that it will prevent them from being molested. And the Islamic Sharia says, if anyone rapes any woman, he gets capital punishment. People with the capital punishment in this 20th century, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless law. It's a barbaric religion. Do you know America, which happens to be the country which is supposed to be most advanced, it has one of the highest rate of rape. According to the statistics, it says that on average every day, more than 1,900 females are being raped every day. Every 1.3 minute, one female is raped. Since the time I'm in this auditorium, it's more than two and a half hours. How many rapes may have taken place? How many? More than 100 in America. I'm asking you a question. If you implement the Islamic Sharia in America, that is every man, when he looks at a woman, he should lower his gaze. The woman should be properly dressed up in the hijab. And after that, if any man rapes, capital punishment, I'm asking you a question. Will the rate of rape increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease the practical law. You implement the Sharia and you get results. And I've asked this question to non-Muslims that Suppose someone rapes, unfortunately, your wife or your mother, and if you are made the judge, and if the rapist is brought in front of you, what punishment will you give? And believe me, all of them said, we'll put him to death. Some went to the extent of saying, we will torture him to death. So why do you have the double standards? Someone rapes somebody else's wife, capital punishment is barbaric law. Someone rapes your wife, you want to give him capital punishment. Why these double standards? And do you know in India, according to the statistics, of Crime Bureau, it says that every 54 minutes, one case of rape is reported in India. How many taking place? Every few minutes, maybe, one case. And no wonder, if you have read the papers of about 10 days back, on the 20th of October, the Home Minister of India, L.K. Adwani, you know what he said? It came in headlines of Times of India. Headline. What it says? That Adwani, Adwani puts a death rap for rapes and recommends an amendment in the law. Headlines in Times of India, 20th of October, 10 days back. On Tuesday, one day before, 27th of October, 1998, he said that he wants death penalty for the rapist. Alhamdulillah. What Islam has said 14 years ago, El Adwan is saying that, and I congratulate him for that. I'm not here to promote any political party. I'm not a politician. But if someone speaks the truth, I have to appreciate it. And if you implement this, surely the rate of rape will diminish. Maybe the next Home Minister may implement the Islamic hijab here also. So inshallah, the rape will be completely abolished. They are coming closer to Islam, I appreciate it. Come to common terms, that has been us and you. Mr. Is, 
that rape is increasing in India, and he rightly recommended that the law should be amended and death penalty should be put for the rapist. And I'm for it. I'm the first Indian to support him. So if you analyze Islam, besides speaking good things, it shows you a way how to achieve that state of goodness. Therefore, I say that Islam, unlike other religion, we speak good things, it shows you a way how to achieve goodness. So therefore, if I have to follow a religion, I would follow a religion which speaks good things and shows you a way how to achieve that good things. Therefore, it is rightly said in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, in Nadina in the Lail Islam. The only religion accepted in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Excuse me, we will not allow any further questions, just uh, on the basis of the organizer I've asked. Achha, okay, uh, another, he has requested ke that person also should be allowed and two, three very brief questions. Yes, you can put forward your question, yeah. brother. My name is Manoj Raicha. My first question is, under the name Universal Brotherhood, you are advertising Islam and on the basis of that, please define your terms when you are saying that Universal Brotherhood you should, act, under the name Universal Brotherhood, you should accept brotherhood to all, whether Muslims, that is follower of Islam, and non-Muslims, which you say kafir, who don't. Otherwise, caught the term Muslim Brotherhood, it will be okay. The brother asked a question that in the name of Universal Brotherhood, I am promoting Islam. Suppose if I have to say that in the best cloth, I am promoting best cloth in market. And suppose Raymond has to be the best cloth. So it's a fact I'm promoting Raymond's. If Raymond's company is best, anyway, I don't get any cut from Raymond's. That's an example. I'm not a dealer of Raymond's. But if I say the best cloth is Raymond, and if the talk is which is the best cloth, I have to speak about that. Suppose I'm giving a talk on who is the best doctor in the world. And if I have to take a person in name XYZ, and if he's the best doctor, I'm promoting him, yes. So similarly, universal brotherhood, I'm telling you that Islam is a religion which speaks about universal brotherhood and shows you a way how to achieve it. Regarding a question, that in universal brotherhood, can you call Muslim and non-Muslim as brother? Or only Muslims as brothers? The universal brotherhood of Islam is all human beings are your brothers. I made it very clear in my talk. I'm not mincing with words. I'm very clear. Maybe it may have slipped. You may not have heard it. I started my talk. In Surah Hujura, chapter 49, verse 13. Ya ayyuhu al-nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shi'uma wa qaba'ila lita'arafu inna kramakum in the law hiyatkaakum in the law alimun khabir that O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other not that you shall despise each other and the most honored in the sight of Allah is the person who has taqwa who has righteousness, who has piety who has God consciousness. In the universal brotherhood are all human beings. The person who has got piety is one who has taqwa or righteousness. I have got two brothers. One is a good person. Actually, I have got one brother only. But suppose I have two brothers. One is a medical doctor like this brother and treating the patient, etc. Cure. And the other brother is a drunkard, is a rapist. Both are my brothers. Who is a better brother? A brother who is a doctor and treats the people and doesn't cause harm to the society. The other brother is my brother, but he's not a good brother of mine. Similarly, all human beings are my brothers. But those who are closer to me are those who have taqwa, who has righteousness, who has piety. Anyone who has piety, who has righteousness, who has God consciousness, is closer to me. It's very clear. I've said my talk and I repeat it. Hope that answers the question. Connected? You have differentiated Hinduism, Islamic and Christianity. In all three religions, there are good things for brotherhood. You have not explained brotherhood in Hinduism, brotherhood in Christianity. The brother said that I have spoken good things about Islam, universal brotherhood. I haven't spoken good things about Hinduism and Christianity. I did speak certain good things. I don't speak everything about brotherhood in Hinduism and Christianity because people may not be able to digest it here. This is what I'm saying, people can't digest. I have to be patient. I know Christianity, I have studied the Bible. I have studied the Hindu scriptures. If I speak on that, I'm not here to create a rift. What I'm here to talk about the commonalities. So what is common I spoke? Hinduism says don't rob, Christianity says don't rob, don't molest, don't rape, fine. Other things on brotherhood, do you know 
Just a sample I'm giving you. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 to 6. It says, I'm quoting, chapter number, verse number, quoting. There's no two doubts about it. He told the apostles that go in not into the way of the Gentiles, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Who are the Gentiles? The non-Jews, the Hindus, the Christian. We are the Gentiles. Don't throw pearls before pigs. He calls us as pigs. Am I going to speak about that? Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24, he says that I have not been sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'm quoting chapter number, verse number. So this means that that religion is only meant for the Jews, not for the whole universe. In other religions, they believe in monasticism. In monasticism. If you have to come closer to God, you have to renounce the world. You have to renounce the world. Most of the major religions, Hinduism says that, Christianity says that, to come closer to God, you have to renounce the world. Quran says in Surah Hadith, chapter 57, verse number 27, that it's against monasticism. Monasticism is not allowed in Islam. Our beloved Prophet said, there's no monasticism. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, in the book of Nikah, chapter number 3, Hadith number 4. Oh, young people, whoever has the means to get married, should get married. Hadith says that. If I agree that if you renounce the world, you come closer to Almighty God, and if every human being renounces the world today, then within a span of 100 to 150 years, there will not be a single human being alive in this world. If everyone practices this law throughout the world, where is the universal brotherhood? Therefore, brother, I am only come to talk about the good points. Unless you want to have knowledge about other religions, it's my job. I have to speak the truth. Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقْ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ لَبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوكَ When truth is heard like in falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. Hope that answers the question. Yes, the chief guest has requested. Uh, we do not allow any further questions now from the mics, neither from here. We will now go into the next session. Now we'll have the respected advocate Prabhakar Rao Hegde presenting his impressions as the chief guest. Dr. Jackie Naik and friends, I deem it my privilege to be here this morning to hear this talk by Dr. Zakir Nayak, the president of the Islamic Research Foundation, and I was really impressed by it. I am a Hindu, but don't go to the temples. Neither introduce religion in my politics. I belong to the Congress. Here, those who came to hear Dr. Zakir Naik should have seen and realized that he is a person who has to do with Islam religion and he will speak only on Islam religion. And I feel it very ha unhappy that some of the people who introduce religion in po politics tried to obstruct his speech by asking inconvenient questions. May I ask them a question? Have they read Vedas? Have they read Upanishads? Have you read any of the religious scripts or because it is convenient to be a Hindu to come in power, they want to canvass religion? My submission is, most respectful submission is, here I came to hear a Muslim scholar on, this, on the topic what his religion wants to convey. Whether I accept or I don't accept is another thing. But uh, I will tell you, that the Hindu religion is there for thousands of years and Islam religion has come 1400 years back. It is a religion which has come up after seeing the torture done by other religions on the people of the world and therefore that is a religion which is more socialistic and has given more the method also how to implement. I remember in 1978 when I contested from Thana from this beauty. I met my friend Isaac Narvel, advocate, and he gave me the translation of Quran in English, which I had gone through before I contested the election. I still remember to have read the contribution of the Muslim in the Freedom Movement of India, a book written by author, and I am to tell my friends here, who are talking about the religion in Hinduism, that it was the Wahhabis who first stood against the British 
in 1833. It is not the Hindu that co collected together to fight the battle of independence, but it was the Muslim who fought the battle of independence. It is unfortunate that we don't, both of us don't go together. It is unfortunate for this country that, but it is really equally unfortunate that some persons want to canvas it and make it a point in politics to introduce religion. I am really impressed by the speech. I have learned a lot. Not that I agree with whatever he has said, but it's a way of thinking and certainly deserves a serious consideration. And I am thankful to him. I thank you all. May I now request respected advocate K.R. Hingorani to present his presidential address. Dr. Nayak, Hegre Sahib, my friends, I'm really honored to have been asked to preside over this function, though of course in a vacancy filling manner. But even then, I'm really proud to be here and associated with the thoughts which are expressed by Dr. Nayak. I'm not an expert on any religion, either mine or of Dr. Zakit's. But one thing I can claim, that I was born in a place where Islam was first brought in to the shores of India. I come from a province known as Sindh. For the first time in my life, I have heard a Muslim scholar, though I have heard so many Muslim Maulanas, who can understand and really read the things comparatively, not only from an exclusive point of view, as normally it is misunderstood by us that Islam is an exclusive religion only meant for compartmental people who believe in certain things and who disbelieve in other things. When he said that we should bring out the commonalities, the common things between the different religions first, and then disagree upon the points which we do not agree upon. I think this is one of the best statements that I have heard in my life. Once I had heard Dr. Radhakrishnan speaking in the same way on the comparative religions of India. And after that, after about 50 years, I heard Dr. Nayak to speak that there are certain common things. <laughs> and really there are certain common things because when he spoke about the taqwa, it's an Arabic word, I think that is the pronunciation. And he said it is God consciousness. I was reminded of my own Shivaism, Kashmiri Shivaism, which also talks about the God consciousness as being the fundamental force in life. That everything emanates from it. It is not born. It is not created. It is not come out of the womb of a woman. It is self-evident, swambhu. It is there in existence since time immemorial. When the time had not started, Shiva was there. And when he talked about God consciousness, I was reminded of that. Hinduism as such is not restricted only to Vedanta. The four Vedas are also very difficult to understand. Of course, he has studied them. I bow before his scholarliness, and I feel that what he says is correct. And I quite agree with him that Hindu word is a geographical connotation. And I'm proud to say that it came into existence because of the Sindh. When the foreigners came to India, they tried to cross the Indus River, especially Sikandar. And he said that it is Sindhu, it, it, is, uh, it, was, it was told to him that the name of this river is Sindhu. And being an Iranian or a Yunani, he could not pronounce Sindhu, he said it is Hindu. Hafta Hindu, they call seven rivers as Hafta Hindu, seven rivers. So I'm proud that the word Hindu has come because the Sindh was there. And really in India we need this type of thing because much misconception has gone there that Muslims are terrorists, somebody asked a question. I mean, I think this is the most reprehensible statement that was ever made, that Muslims are terrorists. This is all nonsense and it should be curbed. And it is because of this that we feel that we are so insecure in this country. You, you cannot treat a Muslim as a terrorist because he is a Muslim. He is a fundamentalist. If he is a fundamentalist of the color of Dr. Nayak, I welcome him. I welcome him to my house.
and you must also know of course i have to talk about these things which i never wanted because when i came i had a spiritual experience by his talk but then recently two three days back there was a news in the paper that the front man for the person in dubai is a hindu i am referring to dr ramesh sharma he is the man who they claim to be the person who coordinated all the works of daud sitting in now whom will you say a hindu is a terrorist or a muslim is a terrorist <laughs> therefore please forget these things forget about muslims have been there bad kings from muslims were there bad kings from hindus were there and they need to be improved but you can't say or hold anything against dr naik for what alauddin khilji did in his times or what aurangzeb did to his brothers or what akbar did these things are nonsense these are facts of history which you have to gloss over you want to live in this country try to understand the common things between the parties bring them out i'll request dr naik to go into hindu congregations and try to make them understand what islam stands for and as far my personal belief is concerned i think islam is one of the greatest things that has happened to this world thank you very much for giving me this honor and hearing me out uh, now we would conclude with the vote of thanks by maulana ataullah assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh मैं ज़्यादा वक्त नहीं लेते हुए अक्सर एजुकेशनल सोसाइटी की जानिब से आप सभी हजरात का बशमूल सदर जलसा मेहमान खसूस मुकर और दीगर आए हुए मेहमानों का और तमाम सामीन का अक्सर एजुकेशनल सोसाइटी की जानिब से शुक्रिया अदा करता हूँ और अल्लाह से दुआ करता हूँ किल्ला है तबारक पताल हमें मज़ीद ऐसे मौाक़ मुहैया करे कि हम एक दूसरे के साथ मिल कर के बैठें और एक दूसरे को समझने की कोशिश करें डॉक्टर साहब की तकरीर का अनवान बकौल अलामा हाली की ज़बान वही था कि यह पहला सबक था किताब खुदा का कि मखलूक कुंबा है सारी खुदा का खलाक से रिश्ता हो जिसको विला का वह महबूब है खाली के दूसरा का अब मैं फिर एक बार मजीद आप सभी हजरात का शुक्रिया अदा करते हुए आप से रुख्सत होता हूँ